Hey, it's the second Panago Pizza Meatless Monday. Have you tried this yet? Well, we're going meatless this Monday and every Monday this summer, and you should join us, okay? So here's the deal. Panago takes you beyond the meat and brings you fresh vegetables, fresh pizza made every single day, and, and basically made to order. Plant-based options are a great way to get more veggies into your diet. And that's the whole point here. We want you to know that Panago knows that and knows you and knows that you got a summer bot that you got to look after. Or at least I'm trying to. It's, n it's not working out well for me. You look great, Adam. Thanks, thanks, Jesse. I appreciate that. Anyway, Panago Pizza Meatless Mondays. Check it out at Panago.com. Stuff your face with veggie deliciousness and plant-based deliciousness too because they have plant-based substitutes. Mmm, yummy. Panago Pizza presents... The Steve Dangle Podcast with your hosts, Steve Dangle and Adam Wilde. Well, it's been a while. Yes. It's been a long time. And for reasons that we really can't get into, we couldn't we couldn't make this happen before. But we're so happy to be able to do this again and hopefully far more regularly. One of our OGs, one of the guys who we, we throw it back first. First top like first three guests on the Something show. Something like that, yeah. Like your old, oh god, how many pieces of property ago? Okay, <laughs> my condo, my yeah. condo. When we used to do it at the dinner table at my condo. Yes. Uh, one Mr. James Myrtle lent his credibility to our little show, and he's back today. Thank you, James, for coming yeah. in. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And there, I actually it's remember the first time, James, when you came over. It's I was first off extremely intimidated. Second, you brought beer too which was really cool and i was like you nice beer. and we had a beer and it had the podcast it was awesome well we did it late at night right it was like yeah. 8 30 at night or something like that and it was hot it yes. was hot yes and i remember when justin Bourne came over later that summer he was also hot and the air conditioning barely worked in that place so everybody was just sweating and did so. Bourne bring beer no he did Bourne not bring, bring beer. beer okay so here's how high maintenance Bourne uh, is no Bourne myrtle was. <laughs> Bourne was uh guys like uh, i i sweat a lot like that's kind of my thing is that i sweat a lot so adam literally had a fan he hadn't put together yet and he had to put it together himself with like a screwdriver. Tower fan. Yeah, it yeah. was one of those. Yeah. Before the show, in and, order and to it get was, it done. And it was behind Justin the whole time. And a bunch of the comments were like, yeah, Bourne was a great guest, but the whole time there was like a. <laughs> 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 he does sweat a lot. He does, does he? That's a, I've been on panels with him, and it's... Man, we, I, I can relate. I'm like that, too. We did a coaches conference last year, and it was out at Humber, and the room was, like, oppressively hot. It was, like, one of those days we had last week, mm -hmm. and they gave us, like, this this issued thing you had to wear, like this this polo shirt, and it was made of, like, polyester. It was made of something oh. terrible. It was so hot. That shiny was, material, right? Yeah, and yeah. he was wearing pants, and he was just dying. We were up there for, like, 45 minutes in this auditorium that didn't have air conditioning, and it oh. was... We Ooh. still talk about it. And and they just had the conference on the weekend, and they didn't invite us back. And <laughs> Born was joking just because I went up on stage and just sweated all over it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, when I see shirts like that, I get nervous. Like, if I have to wear something like that for a promo event, even if it's in the winter, I will sweat through it. And there's certain colors that, like, if it's gray, you'll see it. If mm -hmm. it's a light blue, you'll see it. So I keep it to... Like blues like this or darker blues or black or whatever so people can't see how much I'm actually sweating. It's bad. It's really bad. And, that and goes it, into your wardrobe planning as hell. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, because you got you to plan for temperature. I'm sure Justin, if he heard, hears this, I'm sure he'll be able to relate. I'm oh, sure of it. I'm sure. Yeah, maybe. Listen, Jay. Or may yeah, I'm sure this anyway. is what he wants us talking about. Oh. <laughs> we're, gonna, just gonna go, we're just gonna go deep on this. <laughs> yeah, just an accomplished writer who sweats a lot. That's all. That's what we should talk about that and not his work. Um, so James, obviously, you know, a lot's changed since we I mean we've seen each other. We were hanging out in Nashville in the Stanley Cup finals. We run into each other all the time. I interviewed you for Leafs TV. Uh, we we're talking about Joe Bowen. But like a lot has changed for you since we last talked because the athletic exists. And that was something that was part of the reason, and it's not the athletics' fault, but it was part of the reason we, we couldn't have you on is because there was yeah. there seemed there was a competition thing. Yeah, last time we had you on was pre-athletic. So nuts. you, were our, you our, were our goal is just to get so big that it's not an option there's to no, not have there, us on. Yeah, there's no one. There's no one left. I mean, are you not already there? there. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I I gotta ask from there. Like, we'll talk about the Leafs. All the all the Leafs topics have been beaten to death anyway, but we'll get into all of them, all of them because I'm curious to get your thoughts on them. Um, but, but with the athletic itself, obviously when you, and I don't know if you've talked about this much or how much you can talk about it, but you were in traditional newspapers for a decade. More than that. Yeah. I was like 13 years. And then what happens? Do they, do they call you and say, Hey man, we're starting this subscription website, which at that point I would have been like, 
Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> Subscri- <laughs> you, you mean you got to pay for internet content and then and then on top of that, it's only sports, and then somehow they pulled you over and made you believe, and you guys have turned. Toronto was one of the first markets, and probably what the in the first season the most successful one. We're still one of the biggest markets. Toronto's still really, really impactful for the company. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, they they headhunted me and some other Toronto writers. They flew into Toronto for like 24 hours and they interviewed a whole bunch of people. And yeah, you're right. The idea did seem kind of crazy two and a half, three years ago. Lunacy. For, yeah. yeah. Mm. Almost three years ago is when they, it was September of 2016. And um, I had dinner with, with Adam, who's one of the founders. And you know what? But he had some of the product available to show me. He had the app. He showed me the app and I was like, that looks legit. He talked about the funding that they had and I was like, well, that seems legit. Um, and you know what? Something I had to give at the newspapers too. Like, I mean, we've seen what's happened in the newspapers since I left. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the Globe and Mail hardly has a sports section anymore. And I could see that's the direction it was going when I was there. And you look at how troubled the Post and the Sun Chain are and what's happening at the Star and... It's it's bleak. Scary. In, in, yeah. So something I had to give. And I think whether I stayed or I went and jumped and did this new thing, I knew there was going to be a huge amount of risk no matter which way I went. So, But you were a father at that point, too. Yeah. Like, like and this thing, is a new dad, you're like, you start to think about your mortality becomes a thing, like where, like, your financial mortality, like, oh, my God, what would I do if in a couple of years this website goes under? There's a lot more pressure on you, for sure, that that you put on yourself because like all of a sudden there's like a little kid that's going to be depending on yeah we had we had just bought a house i oh. think we i think we were in the house like a little over a year my son was like one and a half and yeah i have a very understanding wife she's she's <laughs> in the business she like understands the industry she knew i wasn't i, I didn't want to be at newspapers for long term and that didn't make any sense so you know i i made the athletic commit to giving me some term and that's that's where we went. Yeah, it took a, they, they they talked to me in September, and I didn't start at the athletic until December. So there was a lot of conversations that we had to have. Um, Did you go Darren Ferris or Lewis Gross? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I threatened to write for the KHL. <laughs> I did get. I tried it. It didn't work. <laughs> I, I did get. I did get someone to look at the contract. I did get a lawyer, mm-hmm. and uh, just to make sure everything was legitimate, and it was, and. Wow. But in the in the beginning, the story of the athletic is incredible. In the beginning, it was just two guys in this rundown office in San Francisco, and that's it. Like they were doing everything. They were like taking out the garbage. They were like, like they did they did literally everything. So when I started, you know, I was we had like ten full time employees in the whole company. Wow. And to see where we're now, it's you know we have more than four hundred. We're launching in the UK in like two weeks with fifty full time staff. Wow. So now we're starting to go into Canada was the second country. Now we're going in all these other countries, and it's it's massive. Just sorry, you're opening in the UK with 50 new employees. Yeah, full time people. Wow, yeah. I heard that correctly. Holy smoke! What are you covering over in the UK? The well, obviously <laughs> football. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's, but like that's it. Pretty much, yeah. There's, <laughs> there's got to be a hockey writer. No, I no. Want no, 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 Come no, no. I'm sure you'd find some volunteers. We have a lot of UK hockey fans that listen to this show who would volunteer to do it. We get. We get asked for, like, when we started Toronto, we got asked for all kinds of crazy stuff. Like, why aren't you co- covering, like, Ultimate Frisbee? Why aren't you covering, like, X? It's like, no one we cares, have, man. We have to cover something that the, enough people will pay for that it pays for the writer. Then it's the same. Like, if you look at what we're doing in Canada, almost all of our staff are writing about hockey. Almost all of them. Mm-hmm. Like, we, we have a couple Raptors writers. We have a couple, we have three Blue Jays writers. You know, we're doing, we do a little bit of other stuff, but... The vast majority of what we're doing is hockey. Hockey, hockey works. There's enough of an audience that it works for a subscription website, and, and it's going to be the same in UK. Like they know that. Like let's just it's get premier all Premier the, League, yeah, and maybe League Two. Like maybe, yeah, yeah. They do have some League Two people, yeah. Wow, because yeah. some of those teams are are a big huge. deal. Huge, yeah. huge, huge. No, they're doing the same thing they did with hockey, where they're looking for the best beat people on the, every team, and then a bunch of national people, and they kind of pool that together. And I've talked to some of the people over there. They've you know, I've been on the phone uh, helping recruit some of the people, and sometimes they're they're like, "Is this real? Like, is this like <laughs> like you know?" They're kind of, they're kind of just trying to sound me out to um, the mechanics of it. And I was like, "Yeah, it's and I, and I tell them the truth. It's been great. It's been a fantastic company to work for." It's it's just that you're selling it now the way that I like sort of heard about it a few years ago because I remember the first time I heard about the Athletic 
well, it's a subscription bit. No, it's going to fail. Like, that's all I had to hear. People thought I was crazy when I left the Globe. Well, like, I was gonna... I, I remember walking out my last day and, like, shaking people's hands. They're like, well, let's a gamble. And, like, they, like, you know, and... It's... Wow, they're not even... It's such a it's such a shock to them that they can't even be nice on the way out and just say, hey, congratulations and good luck. It's, well, that's a gamble. That's nice. Like, you know, and that's, that's the... Um, that's the kind of move, though, I think a lot of us dream of making. Is that is that you know what I'm gonna give this a shot and when you do give it a shot it actually works and that's what's so cool about it like I'm a I'm a day one guy so I got the introductory rate and I'm so glad I did uh, and I'm <laughs> still you, on it you get I'm to keep it. yeah you get to right. keep it yeah yeah if you signed up early enough yeah so if you signed up now for the first time for a subscription your rate would be a little bit higher than it was back then the athletic pays me to read it I'm pretty sure <laughs> no is that what happened is that how it works yeah, that's, that's okay. part of what appealed to me about joining though is that i remember they were putting the price points in front of me very early on i was like well i think i can get enough people to sign up at that number that would want to read what i'm writing about the leafs and what other people are going to do that i think this can work yeah and they were talking about we only need they originally they were saying we only need eight to ten thousand subscribers in toronto to make it viable and and if you do the math on you know, the money times how many subscribers is like, yeah, okay. I mean, and there's I just, no office, right? Like there's no, no brick and mortar stuff. Not, to not yet. We have an office in New York. We have an office in San Francisco. We have an office in London, England now. Um, wow. And I think, I think Toronto at some point, hopefully we will have some kind of a newsroom. So right now, all your writers in Toronto are working from home. They're working from airports and hotels and arenas and, and from home sometimes too. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's just wow. conference calls if you got to. Yeah, like, I'm on the phone a lot. Yeah. And we have imagine. Slack. Do you guys know what Slack is? It's yeah. like yeah. that Silicon Valley. A lot, most companies use that just to. What was the one we had at Rogers, Jesse? Was that Slack? No. No, no. We had our own Rogers one. There was a Rogers yeah, one. Yeah, they made, they invented their own <laughs> Slack, <Yeah>. essentially. <laughs> but, it's, but it was it's funny vital because it was us. only the managers that posted on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but Slack is actually really useful. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember. Obviously, thinking it was going to fail, but like the second. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. I know. When I, when I heard you were. I was always saying to you how you were going to succeed. <laughs> no, no, you're way. Steve is everybody you worked with at the Globe. I heard of the. I heard of the concept. And he's young, and he's a digital native. Yeah, right. Know. You would. You would think. I also thought Twitter was going to be a fad, and yeah. yeah. What about YouTube? I, I, I YouTube just a fad? Yeah. <laughs> I never thought YouTube was a fad. I have a tendency to be wrong about some things. No, but then I heard you were getting involved, and I was like, wait a sec, that actually makes a ton of sense. Because you sort of got to experience firsthand the errors of, I guess, the old biz, right, with newspapers. But you got your start in blogging. So I wonder how much of that yeah, you, you apply to I, it. I, I'm a digital native. Like, I was building websites and stuff when I was, like, 17, 18 years old. And I was way into that stuff. And when I got into the business, that's what I wanted to do. But that didn't exist. Like, there wasn't, like, in Canada, there wasn't a digital-only outlet that covered sports where you could get a full-time job. So yeah, I had my own website, which I essentially ran for free and got Google ads and got some that money. That was like a, was it Blogspot? Yeah, or? it was Blogspot, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, oh. I started that 2004. Like there wasn't, you know, Blogspot sounds so quaint and ridiculous now, but back then it was fine. Like, they that, were important. Yeah, yeah, that was like what existed. Yeah. And I was one of the very first hockey blogs. There were like four or five other ones. There was, was hardly you, anything. You, Dello, what, what was that guy's name? There was a Tom Vic Benjamin Ferrar. and, and yeah, yeah, that was a reverent Euler fans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't Tyler, wasn't he like Mick 79 Hockey or something? MC 79 MC, Hockey. So MC, all, yeah. everyone had these pseudonyms and it was all these weird sites. And I was the only like media Steve person Dangle. that was doing it. And again, I remember like being in, I was in the sports department. I worked part time at the Globe on the desk. So I would work four to midnight. And that's like a pretty, you guys, are, I'm sure you've worked like crazy shifts oh, or whatever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a pretty, I was like 24, 25 years old. I'm on the desk four to midnight part time. The rest of the time, I was just running, the, writing this website. I would go home and I would work on it to like four in the morning, and then people would come in the morning and there'd be all kinds of content there and whatever. And it it started to take off. And then Vox, uh, Jim Bankoff, who who runs Vox, came and purchased my site and had me oh. come in and uh, so launch you for Vox. launch. Yeah, not for very long. And they they had me launch all their NHL sites, like SB Nation. We, everyone knows it now as this having all these sites but when I went there they had like four hockey blogs or something and they said we want to have every single team it's like okay they had got a big influx of funding mm -hmm. so that was like my introduction to like the startup world the digital tech world and I did that in like 2008 or something I did it for about a year and then the I, I was getting a bunch of job offers and I was going to leave the globe uh, and they wanted me to stay and um I said I wanted an NHL job, and that's how I start, got to start covering the Leafs. It right. was kind of like an ultimatum. Like, 
I have all these other companies that are interested in this this kind of digital stuff that I'm doing. Um, and then I was, then I became a print guy. But if it w- you know if it would have been my choice from the beginning, I would have run something like the Athletic like. 15, right. 15 years ago it just didn't that wasn't a thing that well it would have been pretty tough to I think pull off 15 years ago like the technology is now at a point where and I think enough people are web savvy like to make that yeah there ha- there has to be it was too clunky back then yeah, yeah yeah like I mean think about like your you, your options were PayPal or some unsecured credit card mm-hmm. service or something that you didn't know where it came from well, we and... needed you know what we needed we needed like the tech world in Silicon Valley to get interested in like helping media build something like, yeah the, the story of our company is really one of not just sports writing and media, but it's also the other half of our company is tech and Silicon Valley and innovation. And, you know, we have an office in, in the financial district in San Francisco, and it's 75, 80 staff, and they're all from, like, Facebook and Uber. And uh, there are all these really smart young people who are building this company on the back end. And that's why it looks the way it does. That's why it works so well. That's why... You know, and I know the founders, they envision this as kind of like a tech company as much as a, a media company. And they have a lot of experience on the tech side. They didn't have the media experience. So I was always arguing with them in the very beginning about the way you do things in a media company because we didn't we didn't have anyone else to kind of advocate for that side of the business. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I'm and I forgive for anybody that's listening, that's like, oh, can, can you guys please get to the goddamn Leafs content? I'm like, <laughs> I just, I, I'm, I'm so interested in it because, uh, to be honest with you, so much of what we pull for this show comes from that website, and comes from your writers, um, and I, and it's such a, it's such an amazing thing that a website that was what 2016? Yeah. So 2016. Yeah, we December signed up. 2016. I went there. Yeah. So it's two and a half years. Yeah. And I can remember messaging you at the time and going, hey, this is pretty cool. Congratulations. And like, you know, this is awesome. You were doing like a subscribers event. And it was this uh, the, event where you met people at a bar. The right? Athletics NHL coverage has been in the NHL for less time than Austin Matthews. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And yeah. Yet, but that the, was my, they, the Leafs were a non-playoff team basically when I joined. That was the year that they had that surprise run with all the rookies. Yeah. Right. So it was good for subscriptions in that they were a super exciting team. All the stuff was happening. A lot of, if you go back and look at my first stories for The Athletic, a lot of them are Austin Matthews, like half of the early ones or something like that. I remember one of the first very successful things I wrote was essentially why Austin Matthews is better than Patrick Laine or something like that. And that did incredibly well and got a lot of attention. And, and rightly so. Yeah, it, 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 looks, it looks good now. So. Yeah, it sure does. Yeah. yeah. That's funny that that even going into last season was still a debate. I mean, it, it, look, at, look at the numbers. It, yeah. it should have been. It and then Line been. A fell off a damn Yeah, cliff. and I bet, you know what? I bet that comes roaring back because I think Line A comes roaring back, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. With, yeah, um, well, Line A is more one-dimensional, though. Yeah. It, yeah. 100%. But when and that was the argument like when they were like 20 games into their career that I was making. is that Austin Matthews is bringing so much more to the table. Yes. He, Agreed. I and, and I wouldn't disagree with that at all. I, I think it's just with... You know, with Jets fans, they like their they like their guys, right? I don't blame them. Which is fine because for a while they didn't even have a team. Exactly, right? Uh, so of course they're going to defend it. <laughs> um, yeah. So James, I just I, I I wanted to take a second and talk about that because that was one thing that I always kind of was like that's a seminal moment in someone's life, and I just had like I mean, obviously maybe one day we can actually do like a we can have the you guys and the founders on whatever. I'd really honestly like to just do a podcast on how this all started. I really would love love to. I think it's uh, someone's going to do a book at some point. I think it'd be a great book. You I think mean, so? Yeah. There's. It's. Geez, if you. It's it'll be available you, online. If it's, only you guys knew any writers. It's an amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, someone will do it. It's an amazing story. It's, John Fitzgerald. It's, it's crazy that it worked. It's yeah. really, really crazy. In your journey, how you had to go backwards to the print world and then wait for kind of the tech world to catch up to media and then go back to that world. Because Vox was so ahead of the time. Yeah. And then you go back to print and then it kind of catches up. Well, I literally up. saw that. Like I was using the pub tools for both. Like I would use the what SB Nation had built. And we could, they had this, this pub tool where you could just, you could get a post up in like 10 seconds. It's like headline, bam, here's like two words of text click a button to send the tweet automatically from the account for the site it was it was very smooth and very well designed and then i go into the globe and it's like ooh, yeah Yeah. you know and it's going to take you like eight minutes to post something just because like there's all these levers you have to pull and like it was it was very 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 old school there there was a there was a writer who i will not name but they did not know that their the digital version of their newspaper could host video <laughs> like host the interviews that they were recording and but because 
I had an idea of the back end they were using. I'm like, no, no, I'm pretty sure you can. You got to talk to someone at your thing, and they they eventually. But they didn't want to do any of that. Out. Like I was trying to put charts and Which stuff is on, on the website, and it was it was really complicated to do that kind of stuff. It was like because it, because I, they I were. I found that fr- I found that frustrating, to, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but I have found that very frustrating in my career personally when, you know, because we were. Jesse and I, in, in, in you know, in pop music and that sort of thing, were sort of ahead of the curve on certain things, and people just didn't know, they just didn't care. It was like a sort of a so when you, when you talk to the guys from the from the athletic, the founders, were you like, hey, can I can I publish a chart in my article? Like, were those were those questions that you had? I remember they Adam sat down with me and he was like, you're you're way underutilized in your role. Like, they're just using you to write like an 800 word print story in a newspaper right. and like. You know, we had we had dinner for like two and a half hours, and he's like, "All this, all the experience you have, and all these things you can do, and they're not using any of this." And we wanted, we want to use all of it. So it wasn't just charts; it was, it was everything. Everything. Yeah, I use charts as the example, but like, yeah. there is gifts and videos and everything. Like, it, it, it's funny because I what I love about the articles too is like, Ian Tullock will go into something, or Dom Lecision will go into something that's super complicated, and they'll go. And if that didn't make sense, here's a GIF. And yeah. and then you go and then you go back, you look at the GIF, you go back and read and go, "Oh, okay. Now I sort of get what you're talking yeah. about." The numbers suggest this person does this thing very well. Exactly. Also, here's a video of this person doing something very well. Do you ever forget who writes for the Athletic? I no, I they're all they're all my babies. I, <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I love Cause all. Cuz I of, do. I've forgotten. Well, in can I, I my my role right now with the Athletic and it changes every 6 months is is I'm in charge of the Canadian operations. That's that's what I'm doing. So, I've hired everybody in Canada, work with all the freelancers, all the writers, all the editors. Um we're, we're adding a bunch more this summer is what I've been working on lately. And um I I feel like a personal investment in everybody we've got. I love, I love, like, it's, it's been great building a team and, and having that investment in people like that. I can imagine. So you've never forgotten. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you can no, quiz me. That's I really mean, encouraging. Don't ask me about, like, who's the Baseball, writer yeah. for some NFL team. Like, I don't, I'm afraid I don't know that. But well, we're so, like, we have 350 writers, that's not including UK coming. We have that's a, unbelievable. We have a lot. Where do you think's next? Like, where's the athletic going? Uh, well, the podcast network that we've started is going to get built out. We're going to UK. I imagine we, we do do French in uh, Quebec, but I think I could see us doing other languages in other countries, that that'll be a thing. Um, but, you know, we kind of go in, 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 in stages, and the stage for 2019 is build the podcast network out, go into the UK, continue to scale up some of what we're doing in in the markets we're in already and get stronger in those markets and i don't know what the plan is for 2020 yet they'll they'll tell me when it's time for me to know that but that's that's kind of like above my pay grade sure how about the athletic mississauga where you only cover the 905 the steelheads and (laughs) that's it well i sometimes wonder like the york nine of the (laughs) cpl you gotta cover the york nine a, the lot of the, club. a lot yeah. of the papers in those small cities are gone. Like, yeah. Uh, you, the Camel's Daily News, where I grew up, is gone. It doesn't exist. And the building's been torn down and it's a parking lot. And it's so who's going to write about that team? And I often wonder, like, is there a business model there where it would make sense that we have a writer covering teams like that? And like, or even a development business model where you're developing your next your next generation. Sure. sure. Right. And right now we're kind of doing that with freelancers. And a lot of the people on our staff, like Dom, Scott Wheeler, uh, we just we hired Harmon Dale in in Vancouver today. They started as freelancers and they're just writing like once a week or every two weeks or whatever. And then that's been our kind of feeder system. But yeah, you're right. Like if you know, we if we had smaller markets, we could do that. Like I wonder if we had a writer in Newfoundland writing about their hockey team, if that would be viable for us. Mm-hmm. Like you mean the Growlers? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or I mean- or Halifax or like there's there's these city city centers that have like what's Newfoundland what's St. John's have like 250,000 people something like, like that yeah you uh-huh. know if we can get like 3,000 of them signed up it, and it you're would, the only resource for that team yeah, it, would, th- it would work for that us that pays yeah. the bills right yeah. yeah yeah. you gotta tell Scott Wheeler to stop traveling then <laughs> cause he's just he's just taking it up for everybody he's driving out to the boonies like Oshawa right at him oh, he's going man. to Jenny's games he's going to Peterborough Several but that's what Scott wants to do like that's his <laughs> like that's his dream in life is to go to all of those games and to go to Oshawa, and pretty not much. Even, Scott, not even call, call me once. I am convinced if Scott wasn't a writer, he'd be a scout. Like that just seems to be he. He's like a kind of like a road guy, loves to be at the game sort of person. Just seems like that. Doesn't wear enough black. 
No, truly, no. All scouts wear black. <laughs> where are the and, scouts? Where are they? It's those five guys up there. And they have to have lanyards. Yes. If he doesn't have a lanyard, he can't be a scout, right? Yeah, even if there's no pass <laughs> attached to it, it's like an old one because they feel naked That's right. without it. That's right. Yes. I, I hate lanyards. I never I wear hate those. Too. Yeah. Oh, I can't stand. We're them. supposed to wear it at the like at the Leafs games. We're supposed to wear that. I never. I never do that. Well, I, I'm going to ask you about this, and, and you know, this it's my job to ask you about this, but we don't have to get too deep into it. Um, you've, you've taken some criticism from, from people in the traditional spot, right? Like the people who are... We did? Yeah. <laughs> no. I've, I've seen a few tweets from here, from here and there, and I don't know if, it's, if it's any of it's personal, but when you, when you do hear criticism from people from the traditional side, so we talk about newspapers or whatever else... How do you handle that? And and is it usually, does it come from a place of, uh, would you say fear or is it not understanding or is it, do they feel threatened? Like, what is that normally, do you think? I think it could be one of all three of those things. I think, I mean, like I said, the business is in trouble and I feel bad for, you know, people have put their lives into these, you know, I was in that situation. I put 12 years in at the Globe and it's like, I don't think there's a future here and it's it's a scary situation so i could see that if you're in one of those situations and there's this new thing and you're not part of it mm -hmm. could it's could probably this, probably natural that there's some animosity could this model work for news yeah i think so yeah could, could we do. get news back into local markets again uh i mean i don't know to what scale but i think you could do i think you could do business coverage i think you could do health coverage you could do politics you probably do entertainment you could probably do like a lot of different verticals we're just sports like we basically mm -hmm. pulled sports out of a sports section and it lives on its own but yeah i think you could start doing some other things the political oh, that yeah. sounds like a nightmare <laughs> <laughs> i won't be subscribing yeah, to that yeah. one um <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a, just an awful thing that sounds like about. it'll fail <laughs> sorry I just, I just feel obligated to say that um <laughs> do, do you ever do you feel a pressure with uh you know the athletic sort of being Man, a lot of people in the industry were really cheering for the athletic hard because we were just watching it shrink around us, and we're like, okay, please. And it still hasn't you know, stopped shrinking, by the way. Let's put that out there. Oh, for the rest sure. of the industry, yeah, I know. It's just wanted to uh, see how to, uh, the rest of the industry. <laughs> no, but like, but no, it's, it's true. It's like the press box at the Leafs game has a whole bunch of empty seats now, which is it's like it's crazy. Yeah. It's yeah. just like there's not enough people to. Yeah, oh yeah, they should sell. Them. So, <laughs> just, don't put it past MLC, they'll do it. I will not. But do, do you feel a pressure as sort of this, I don't know, the, basically the one place that is growing, for, for lack of a better term, uh, and as the digital entity to sort of always be at the forefront of, like, evolution? Do you always want to be first I don't know. on whatever's there's, next? There's, yeah, I mean, because it'd probably be good for the company, but... Like, it's not up to us to create something else that's going to be like us to give other people jobs. Like, we can't. Right. We're, not, not, we're not going to do business. that. All we can do is do the best we can do. And the way I look at it is, like, as long as we can keep doing well and getting more people hearing about us and signing up, that means we can hire another writer. And then we just keep doing that and keep doing that. And keep, like, I want us to replace the sports sections in all of the cities. Right now, my role is Canada. In Canada, I want to replace all the sports sections uh, across Canada. And we're not there yet. You know, like, we don't have three Canucks writers. We don't have, you know, the way that sports sections did 10 years ago. And I think that we can get there. So there's still lots of progress for us to make. But will there be other places that can have similar success? I hope so. I, I, I wonder about, because you are the guy that does a lot of the hiring. And there are a lot, we get messages all the time from people who say, I want to be in sports. I don't want to do what you guys do. I like the podcast, but I don't want to talk. There's a lot of people who just don't want to talk on the on camera, right? They don't, they don't want to be in front of a microphone, but they want to write. And it's like, okay, I can write for, you know, the local blogs and that sort of thing. But is there a future in that money-wise? I mean, they don't pay well. Let's just be straight with that. They just don't. Or at all. Uh, or at all. <laughs> yeah, don't get into it for that. You're in it for the development. Bingo. Yeah. What do you look for in a great young writer? Or it doesn't have to be young. Just a great writer on the upswing. Yeah, no, they don't necessarily have to be young. I mean, we've had some people that have come in as prospects who were a little bit older. But, I mean, it. this is going to sound really dumb, but, like, you have to be really good. Like, you have to really be able to stand out. And I think that you just you can't be producing what's out there and available for free and then put it behind a paywall and expect people are going to be like, oh, you know, it, 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 it just doesn't work. That's what we saw really early on is that if we did anything that looked – or read like something that was available for free online it was just like it did absolutely nothing for us so we quickly moved away from that in the beginning 
So we look for writers. Like I, we were talking about Bourne earlier. He's a good example. Dom's a good example. People that have a very, very... Down Goes Brown has been amazing for us. We got him last September full-time. Uh, Jason Botchford, rest in peace, was mm-hmm. amazing for us. People that have this really distinct brand are, are super important to us. It's interesting. They seem to all bring very unique perspectives. When I read what Bourne writes, it's such a personal thing. He's been a coach. He's been a player uh, at a high level, both at high levels. And seems to have a, a way of looking at things. And then you look at, you know, Dom or what Ian Tullock brought. I'm a huge fan of Ian and Dom. But, um, you know, those guys, I find those guys challenge not only my viewpoints, but my intelligence. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I'm not as smart as those people. And it's kind of fun to read them because I have to read it several times to get it. It's, it's like going back to school a little bit. Like, <laughs> I don't know what the hell some of these things are. And... When you it forces you to go okay. I'm a I'm a huge sports fan. I'm like that one percent fanatic sports guy, especially with hockey. I like the fact that it actually challenges me, and I don't think that's the interesting part about the athletic is that for so long, the 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 thought was just give them what they want at a grade three level of reading, and and don't get too deep because nobody's going to understand what you're talking about. The athletic seems to go. Let's turn that on its head. Let's challenge our readers. To, to rise to this level I say, to, like, depth is what we talk about all the time. It's what we talk about all the time. And we don't have some of the limitations that the newspapers had in terms of, you know, really short word counts and, like, you're talking about with the charts and all those kinds of... You know, we have some writer, like like Murad in, in Winnipeg. I mean, I don't know if he ever files anything that's under 3,000 words. Like, he's just... <laughs> Jonathan Willis, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so, like, depth is what we talk about a lot. And there's an audience for that. There's an audience that wants that. And... You know, if we did the grade three level thing, it just it wouldn't work with a subscription product. We got to. And I think the people that are subscribing to us are kind of the next level people that want to be challenged, that want to learn something, that want to consume this kind of content so that they're taking something away from it other than just what the player said or something like that. Hmm. What When was the last time you had a piece come across your desk or email, I guess, that was just way too long? You're like, no way. Slash that. Oh, it happens. For sure it happens. Does it? Because, well, because we're asking for this depth and we're asking for people to go deep and, and, and reach. So sometimes you get people that reach you far and it's, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, well, and you, 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 you might lose people? Because that, well, I mean, that's, that's, that's a challenge that's, with us sometimes. That's where the editors come in. And we have, a, we have an awesome editing staff. Like, who do you, the, the group that we have, they don't get any of the credit for, but that's why most of the time you're not reading stuff on the athletic that's like oh what's going what's going on here i'm I'm buried in the weeds here because we're trying the bigger we get the more staff support staff we have and the less that that's going to happen it's 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 just something that's always interested me because one thing sportsnet has uh has like really tried to hammer home for me and i think it's made me a better writer is i used to write way too long and they got me they're like no thousand word limit because mm-hmm. I, I was just everything i was handing in was three thousand words so like absolutely not <laughs> you got to figure what, uh, out a way to, to slash that yeah there's down. not it has to be something pretty good to live at that length for sure right. i mean i think the sweet spot's like 1200 to 1800 words in there yeah. is like you can say something of substance in that mm-hmm. it's kind of like radio breaks they 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 usually kind of tell us and at least in the format that we're in and with jesse and i you should be able to get it done in about two and a half minutes but we say to Dom and, and Ian Tullock and, and these people, like, maybe that should be like a two-part story. Maybe that should be like a three-part thing. Maybe that, and it's easier to digest and it, we can spread it out on the site. And and you have the ability to do that. That's the cool part. Like, you have, subscri- you have people who are actively trying to be there, right? So, like, what I love about, say, for this podcast is that versus, like, um, radio. Radio is a little bit different because it's a passive listen. You can have it on in the background. When someone is listening to this show, they've actively been seeking us out. You have to look on the internet, go through a couple apps before you can actually download the podcast. The Athletic's the same thing. You act, you have active participation rather than what's in the sports page today. It's, I subscribe to this, I want this. And I think that's what's so neat about it. And with young guys like that who have so much knowledge, just exploding with it, it's kind of cool to see them be able to, to transform that, right? And it, what, what I found interesting too is that you're not afraid to pull from the blogs. Not afraid to pull oh, no. these guys. No, 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 no. No, I mean that's a lot of our talent has come through. Like that's that's the pipeline. You mm-hmm. know, you were you guys were talking about development. I mean, that's how I developed. I was hammering out four crappy blogs a day, and <laughs> but I mean, ev- so eventually, many people have been have been people in your position in traditional media have been very hard on the blogging culture. 
very hard on these on these young guys. I love. I think I'm a product of it, 100. percent And like, I think some younger people on, on social media stuff don't realize that they don't know that that's the place that I come from. But like, I'm still reading what's there, and I'm still. I love all those. But that's why we're hiring. You know, if you look at our staff, our staff in Canada is young. We have not just gone and hired a whole bunch of newspaper people. We've really looked for digital natives. I mean, I'm trying to think. Like in Canada, our staff is it's like 27 full time people, and then we have a big group of freelancers. And the, there's not most of them are what we're talking about. They're they're younger writers that have come from online. Mm-hmm. With some down goes Brown and Born, but I consider those guys to be young writers as well. I mean, they're yeah, if they're if they're old world. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I mean, <laughs> they can't be old yet. Um, but I, also young at heart. Like yeah. Douglas Brown is one of those weird guys where he's like I feel like he's my dad, but also like my son yeah. at the same time. The way he talks, <laughs> he's definitely a weird cat. Yeah, he yeah. is a very interesting guy. I'd love to talk to him because you I, should have him on here. He's, we'd love he'd to. be amazing. We should. We tried to for a while, and we couldn't get it to work out. And then I just sort of gave up. So, which is stupid. No, we, we'll yeah, get we, we gotta have. We'll him. Get we, him. We're trying to get a podcast off the ground that would be him doing something because I think it would be fantastic. Mm-hmm. Does he have with his articles? And I've got another question about about something that I want to get to in just a second here. But as a, as an aside, with with Sean Sean McIndoe, if you don't know, that's re- down goes Brown. Um, with Sean, does he actually have like a photographic memory? <laughs> or is he just a brilliant oh. researcher? He's a smart guy, for sure. He was working for Corel in Ottawa. That's what he was... I can't remember exactly... I think he was... Man, I, I can't remember exactly... But he, like, he's a really bright guy who... And I, there, I think this is true for a lot of people. He wanted to work in sports and he liked the idea of media, but he's like, he didn't see a future in that, so he went to another path. And then he starts his blog and his his Twitter account and starts getting noticed and starts getting jobs. The National Post gets him as a freelancer and that's how his career builds. I mean, he has one of the more, like Steve, has one of the more unorthodox career paths that's come out of the internet being a thing that exists. So, but yeah, his process, I've never gone down that wormhole, <laughs> but I bet he just reads everything. I bet he's just plugged in on a whole bunch of stuff. I, he's forgotten more today than I can remember my entire life. He's, like, it's unbelievable. He's the a stuff big reader. Can I love hanging out with him and getting a beer with him because you just never know what he's going to talk about. And it's always like, he just keeps you on your toes. It's always interesting. Cool. I've, I've never met him. He's a I've very quiet. I've hang out with him once. He's a very quiet yeah. guy. Oh, like, okay. He's not like his persona at all. But when he gets excited, though, it's a lot of fun. You ever see him excited? Uh, what did he do? I don't know. I don't, know. I don't even. What's the context here? I, I, can't, I can't tell this story. It's it's his to tell because it's, it's okay. Freaking when we have legendary. Him on, there's a story to tell. Yes, it's legendary. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, when I was, what I remember about him because he's so dry as yeah. well. When when we were driving around, I would always I'd go for my wallet to pay for the cab because we were in Philly, and and he'd just go, no, don't worry about it. It's on Walt. It's on Walt. It's on Walt. And finally, I, I go, who's Walt? And I didn't realize that he worked for Grantland. ESPN. Yeah. Or yeah, Grantland, oh, yeah. which parent company was Disney. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, he had, yeah, like, he had like a Mickey Mouse credit card, I think. I remember being at the cup final with no him way. and then he was using that. Yeah, I think it had Mickey Mouse on it. I wonder if Wyshynski's got one of those now. Probably. Probably. Yeah. I'll have to ask him. Um, Probably, man. Can, can I ask a question? Please, please, uh, Like a broader question? No. What do you think of the news cycle that's developed in the last like two years, two, three years, where something will happen on like a Wednesday and by Saturday it's no longer a story? It's kind of yeah. old news. Like, uh, how are you guys even adapting? faster than that? Right? Yeah. Like, yeah, we talk about story timing is really important for us too. Like, we want the depth that Adam's talking about, but we also don't want to, it, we don't want to have some in depth article a week later because mm-hmm. then people have already chewed over every single thing. So, but that's always existed that there's this push pull between doing something quickly but not very good and spending time on it and like where's the right balance for it and the you know, the Milan Lucic James Neal trade on Friday like that's a good example that happened at like four o'clock on Friday or something like that which was not great for my Wasn't Friday great afternoon for me no. I had just done a week of radio bastards <laughs> yeah. and when nothing had happened <laughs> yeah. nothing nothing <laughs> I was dying that's, all week that's the Oilers punishment for you making fun of them for I so know. long and the Truba extension same thing yeah. but like by today it's already been dissected a million oh, times I think we've had like eight stories on it or right. something and so like we our writers know that like ideal world and I know from being in the business. Like, if I can get something up, that's why often after a Leafs game, if something has happened that's of note, Nazem Kadri getting suspended, I'll write till like three in the morning, just so that we have 
we have the most in-depth piece we can the next morning. Because if you wait to write that piece, you're you're just losing bandwidth. Like you're just you're losing the interest level that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have right. to be good and fast and all of these things. It's it's definitely challenging. Yeah. I'm um, gonna do more night of well, LFRs. What's been so interesting <laughs> is like it. I growing up, you know, I would read the sports pa pages on every newspaper. And when I actually worked at Shoppers Drug Mart on my breaks, we got all the newspapers for free. So I was able to pull the sun and the star and the globe and the post. And I would kind of read them all and you start to get to know the writers and that sort of thing. And like what I loved about the sun was they all had these like mean mugging shots. They're like, this is Steve Buffery and he's pouring a glass of water Who's, on you. Oh, that's Steve Buffery. And, yeah, and, the, and okay. this is, you know, Steve Simmons' picture. And they're like, everybody had their own sort of thing. One thing that I never saw, I never saw, and I've now at least seen this twice, maybe more, with with the athletic is the writers of the content getting hired by the nhl teams that they talk about that is an accomplishment that's actually happened to us a bunch of times we had jack hahn f freelancing for us and then the leafs hired him rachel dory was writing for us and the devils hired her dello has been hired by the devils obviously um and we just lost ryan beach in, in vancouver so that and that's just canada staff like those are other than tyler who's a friend of mine. I mean, those are young people that we brought in to kind of freelance and do that training ground thing. Are you calling Tyler old? Is that what's happening? Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, he's older than I am, so that... that <laughs> that was older than you? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. And he just had a kid, too, so oh, con congrats congratulations to, to Tyler. Yeah. Hey, that's awesome. Um, Little Chartnello. <laughs> it's a girl, so... Huh? Chartina. 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 <laughs> <laughs> My, my bad. Sorry. He's going to be listening to this back and over and over and over again, and I'm sure I'm going to hear about it in a day or two. Well, uh, hey, listen, I, I would I would be shocked if he listened to the show. To be honest with you, it seems below him. Well, <laughs> he's oh my god, so uh, far below him. No, no. He, he, How dare they insult my little graphene? He'll find out he was mentioned, and he'll need to. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, fair mm -hmm. enough. But I mean, that's so. So so what happened? I'm pretty sure what happened is that not in every case, but in a lot of cases. There, we have a lot of GMs and assistant GMs and co head coaches and this around the NHL and players and everything that are reading The Athletic. So we hire, let's say, Jack Hahn was one of the first people I hired. He might have been the first person that I was like, come come write for us um, just as a freelancer. And so those people are getting more on the radar of some of these GMs and that, that we're just seeing their work on our site and thinking it's interesting and interviewing those people for jobs and... There you go. See, that's interesting because that was what, one of the questions I was going to ask you is, you know, would it surprise people to know how many people from within the NHL actually read The Athletic? It oh. sounds like there's quite a few. Yes. Yes. And there have been, you know, cases where I've called people and they're like, I don't usually talk to the media, but I really like The Athletic. I'm going to talk to you. And then, yeah, I know. It's, hey. it's interesting. It's been really good. Yeah. For that. Inter any, any names that surprise you or any names that you'd be willing to name? I would actually, as a writer, would rather not know who's... Like I don't look I through. I totally get that. I don't look mm. through like all the data for how many times is I don't know. Pick any GM. How many times is it, what stories is this GM reading? Like <laughs> I, I'm not going to look at any of that stuff. That's not. No. Mm -hmm. But it's better not to know that. I think I wouldn't want to know. Oh, a hundred percent. Because then it then it affects your well. This so and so could be listening. Like you know what I mean. You, you got to be 100%. and like obviously they could be listening and sure. you know that. But I don't. I'm not going to seek that out. But we. I've gotten it a lot more than with the Globe, where it's just bringing everyone collectively together has made it somewhere where it's brought. There's writers that people wouldn't normally read that are being read now by by people. Well, Rachel was twenty, right? Like that's so I know the story there. So I mean, she was hired by the Devils. I mean, the Devils read her work on the Athletic, and that's the connection. And then you know they asked for her contact information, and that's that's what happened. That's one nuts. one degree of separation. It's nuts. <laughs> that's like, it. And wow. that's that's the thing. Like you you, I mean, obviously Tyler's been hired before. He's got unfortunately with the team he was hired with originally, they just they won't listen to anyone and won't get out of their own way. But well, you know, I mean, going from the Oilers to the Devils has worked out for others. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I think you know you look at the uh, you look at that, that to me really says something. Like that's a real that's a real uh, testament to the people that you're hiring. And I. I wonder if you expect it to happen more. I now. hope not. No, I hate it. I don't like it. I don't. I don't like it happening. No, no, probably not. And and you know my superiors don't like it happening either. And but it's it is good. I mean mm -hmm. it's and I'm happy for the people for sure. Yeah. I mean Tyler is you know that's that's where he belongs. He was just kind of moonlighting with us. <laughs> mm. 
<laughs> Imagine being able to moonlight with the athletic. Ah, I'm going to go back to the yeah, NHL now. He'll fall back Unbelievable. on the athletic. I'm excited. It's funny. There seems to be an effect. And it's so funny that P.K. Subban, of all people, ended up in New Jersey this year. Mm-hmm. Um, given it kind of makes sense, right? It well, I think it makes sense, but like with Tyler's opinion on on these sorts of it's it's going to be so interesting to watch his effect on the Devils. Do you think? Because Ray Shiro is a bit of an old school guy. Tyler's pretty convincing, from what I understand. I've met him once. Do you think that there's going to be? Um, do you think there's going to be a a major change in what the New Jersey Devils do now that Tyler's as because he's not just coming in as some guy. He's got a VP position, does he not? Yeah, I mean he's I don't know the exact title, but it's it's senior, like director of analytics or and there's going to be more and more of those more teams that have that title. And the other thing too is I mean he had a lot of teams talking to him too. Like it wasn't just there wasn't just one team that was trying to get him. So um, yeah, I think the Devils are going to change what they're doing, and I mean that comes back to their ownership. I mean their ownership group is very. We're talking about the athletic being new school and tech and all that. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of that big data money that's on the Eastern Seaboard is investing in buying teams, and then the, with the ownership group is progressive and believes in using data to to make decisions. Then that's why we're seeing those changes. Wow, fan, cool, <laughs> just yeah. very very cool. Seriously, yeah. Um, I guess I don't know one more thing, and then we'll yeah, get yeah, on to gonna, actual we'll into, sports. Yeah. Um, we can tell people to skip ahead. The- yeah, what <laughs> I think they'll be interested in this. To be honest with you, I think it's pretty cool. I mean, we've talked about the Bachelor. Like, I, I think yeah. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't ask me because I don't. We we can oh, go low with this show. Full of drama this season, James. <laughs> queer Eye can do. I can't do. Oh, bad. I can't do Bachelor. Really good. Is, yeah. Has anybody watched the newest season? Yes. No. Well, I started. I'm halfway through. One episode. Oh, one episode. We we put on season four, the first episode last night, and then yeah. the baby cried like five minutes in, yeah. and I was like, uh, <laughs> we'll watch well, five the, more the baby minutes lasts tonight. Longer and then, I, didn't. I feel you. I, I, feel I you. cried much sooner than that. <laughs> <laughs> then five minutes into that, that first episode, oh, it's just, yeah. just, 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 I yeah. can't even remember what the first one was. Um, <laughs> the uh, so uh, Prince obviously worked great, and you've been talking about you know you're expanding into podcasts. Is video going to be part of that as well? And will all this be behind a paywall as well? I'm assuming. Yeah, all the podcasts are behind the paywall, and we've done some video. Have you seen, like, we did a, there, we had a Subban video. We haven't done a lot of hockey video yet, but... I, I, I only watch my own stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but we actually, we have a video session. Um, we have someone that we hired from HBO that's producing it, and... Jesus! I'm trying to think how many videos <laughs> we've cool. done now. They're, they're like mini-docs. They're like 12-minute documentary kind of pieces. Uh, there's been some on sports gambling. There's been some on um, land speed racing. There's been, like, there's all kinds of land speed record racing, and... Um, I think that's going to be the model for us is like try and do video sports video differently than because like we're competing with like big networks and they're obviously going to have like the rights to the games and those things so we have to try and offer some other kind of element yeah I mean we're going to keep experimenting with different kinds of mediums we're not saying you called it print we don't call it print because we don't actually print anything out unless mm-hmm. unless right. you hit like the print button on your computer yeah. or something but text you know, yeah okay like yeah and and we have been successful there but by no means do we want to just Rest on your laurels. We don't want to confine ourselves to one thing. Mm-hmm. I like that. That's going to be very cool to watch. Neat. Yeah, I'm um, interested. Okay, James. So, uh, your first reaction to the Milan Lucic James Neal swap? Well, Duhatchik had been rumoring it was going to happen for a while. He kept talking about it over and over again. It's like, okay, enough, Eric. Like, we're tired <laughs> of hearing about. And there was that thing with Louis Erickson was thrown in there too, and it was like this. Three-way swap of bad six million dollar deals. I didn't think it was going to happen <laughs> just because it felt like. James Neal had more value than Lucic just because you can, doesn't he you can mm-hmm. yeah. yeah you you can fire that contract in the sun too if you don't want it because you can just buy him out and it's like goodbye whereas like Milan Lucic has the David Clarkson unbreakable contract that is just it's indestructible you can't get rid of it you so can't buy it out why would unless James Neal and I understood I, I from what I understand there was some uh, he was not on board with whatever management was trying to do uh, if he's not a personality fit there. Milan Lucic, like that. I don't understand that. Like, and, and it's nothing against Milan Lucic personally, but when you watch the like, any Oilers fan will tell you the where's he going to play? It's just you're like, I mean, it's effectively dead cap space either way, right? And you're trying to get a piece. Like, he, he, this is the same thing. Like, I know when Columbus got David Clarkson from the Leafs, they traded Nathan Horton, and it's like. We don't love David Clarkson, but can he play in our fourth line and play like eight minutes a game? They were like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe we're getting like something. And I wouldn't be surprised if, like, if Calgary looks at Lucic and is like, 
and he's only going to play seven minutes a night and give them like a physical element and whatever. I mean, that cap space feels dead to them anyway. I, I know you talked to people in Calgary and they said James Neal was their worst player many, many, many nights last year. Most nights. Kent wow. Wilson, who's our analyst guy in Calgary, said that he was the worst player on the ice over and over and over and over again. Which Did, makes no sense to me because... Especially coming off that run they had with Vegas. Back-to-back? You went to back-to-back cup finals, right? Nashville. Could that be and, it, though? Could he Vegas? just be tired? Maybe. I think what we're seeing around the league is that players are aging out faster than ever. And but like he went from twenty five to six. Yeah, and some of that's he didn't mesh with. They were trying to get him on that top line with Gaudreau and Monahan. It didn't work. Yeah. So then all of a sudden he's bumped down to a different line, and then it really didn't work. You yeah. know. So like, whereas if you're in Vegas and you're being, I don't want to say propped up, but like you're being elevated by really good line mates, and then you play with the good line mates in Calgary and it doesn't work. All of a sudden you're not with good line mates. You're not getting as much ice time. You can go from twenty five to six or what, seven goals. I think he had something yeah. like that. Yeah. Less yeah. than it was, Lucci's, it was terrible. Think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Lucic had six. Yeah. So, but I think what we're going to see, we're going to see players age out of the NHL faster and faster. You know, the more analytics you get and the more, like, the, the Leafs guys wear this, like, bra thing that's got, like, a, it's got, like, a it's got, it's sensor got a tracker. in it. Yeah. yeah. And it, it, it's got a gyroscope in it. It can, like, measure how their body is. It, like, the more that the players are getting evaluated, not just in terms of, of numbers, but in terms of actual data and harnesses they're wearing and all this kind of stuff they're going to be able to see when they decline and if you have a player in your organization over a long this is what's happening in other sports nfl they do some of this stuff they can see like the the load on each leg and they can see when this oh this guy's knee is blown out or so when his back's out we're talking about big data like there's like they're going to be able to get biometric data on all the nhl players and i think that what teams are going to see is they're going to be like this guy's knees no not as like we can see what it looked like three years ago on our charts and he's now he's not skating the same way and Whoa. So I wonder, like, you look at the way that, let's bring it to the Leafs, you look at the way the Leafs are constructed, they have hardly any players right now that are older than, what, 29? Is Yeah, Tyson Berry might be the oldest at 28. Him and Tavares well, were Tavares. drafted Tavares. 2009. Yeah. Um, Frederick Anderson, I think, is 30. Like, there are not very many older players on the Leafs. Muzzin, 30. Spezza, obviously, 36. Oh, yeah, Spezza's yeah. it. Yeah, wow. he's making league minimum, right? Yeah. And that's going to be more the model, is it like if you're an older guy who's declined you either got to take a really huge pay cut to stay in the league or you're not going to be in it. Wow. Wow. I mean, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, go ahead. and it matches perfectly with the predicament the Leafs are in, really. And Scott MacArthur was sort of beating this point on the radio last week. Um, it was supposed to be you're on your entry level, then you sign a whatever contract it's not very long where you make some money and then your big payday is basically for all the hard work that you did not necessarily which makes no sense if you think about it (laughs) right no it doesn't make any sense but it's finally changing over Right at a time where it screws the Leafs the hardest. <laughs> but yeah, had this happened two years ago, the Leafs would be oh, fine. Oh, but yeah. the Leafs are smart in that they don't have... They did. They had to get rid of a couple bad contracts, but they don't have any bad contracts. If you look at the way that the roster is now, there's not... If they had to... People ask me, well, if, if Marner gets 11 or 12 or whatever million, who are they, who's next to go? Who are they going to cut? And it's like, well, there's not really a lot of fat on this roster. There's nobody that you point to, and it's like, that's a bad contract. they got to get rid of that. Which means they can get value back if they yeah. do have to move someone. yeah. I like, suppose, but it's it, it just means you're maximizing the value of your cap space if mm-hmm. everybody's making what they should be or less. Well, is that why you're talking about the biometric stuff and obviously, you know, Jake Gardner is unsigned still. And I know we're, mm-hmm. we haven't gone into the Leafs yet, but why? Is the back that bad? And we know Parise had a really bad back injury that was similar. It's not the back. No, it's not the back. I, the Gardner thing's... There's just a number of pieces in play that they're that they're waiting on. Like I, I, he's he's gonna Marner? sign. No, no, I don't. No, he won't sign in Toronto. Okay. No. no. But he's gonna sign somewhere else. He's gonna get a contract. You, can, it's not like he's not getting offers. Can you elaborate on the piece? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd rather write, I'd rather write the story than tell you the whole oh, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put that behind the paywall. Yeah, I think subscribe. that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> but no, I think Jake Gardner's gonna be fine. He's gonna get a contract. He's gonna play somewhere. He's gonna be in the top four, maybe potentially top pair. There are teams that want him. He's a good player, and his back is is fine. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, well, the NFL, a league with non-guaranteed contracts, seems to be the most honest league about talent, and like they'll cut you as soon as you stop performing. Do you see the NHL shifting towards that direction as they get smarter and smarter well, with evaluating talent? I mean, they can't do that because the contracts are guaranteed, right? Like mm-hmm. they can't. 
so you're kind of stuck with these Luciches and Andrew Ladd and James Neals and Louis Erickson. And there's all these guys that if it was just on merits, like you're talking about, would they be in the league or not is a fair point. Mm-hmm. So mm. do you see shorter contracts coming than the NHL oh, yeah. players? Oh, we're starting to see that already. To have we're, the turnover. Yeah. I mean, I think some teams are getting leery of doing the long term deals. Mm-hmm. And I think that could be what happens with someone like Gardner is that you can't necessarily get the seven year deal that you used to get in free agency every time when you're 28, nine or 28 years old and you go into free agency. I think teams are going to get more and more cautious about that and be more willing to do two, three, four year deals hmm. at bigger numbers. Potentially. Maybe not though. Maybe, maybe like not, maybe yeah. teams are moving away from these older and that's happened in baseball, right? I mean, there were yeah. older free agents that Oof. had a really hard time signing last year. And I think that that's coming to hockey real fast. And then the thing you're seeing is like the average age in the NHL is dropping every year. And teams more and more are putting their entry level guys who are cheap onto the roster. It's easy to do. So you, the life cycle of an NHL player has changed dramatically in the last like ten years. Do you believe that? I mean, the Leafs have been very patient with guys like Sandine and Lilligren and that sort of thing. And well, they are nineteen. So. They are nineteen. But, but you just said, you know, the ELC guys making the main the main roster. Is are we going to see more of those guys? I'm not necessarily thrown to the wolves because only the top of the top talent are ever going to make it anyway. But are you going to start to see guys like that not have the AHL careers that they have beforehand so that teams can accommodate I salaries? think that's already happening. That's already happening in the NHL. Like, if you look, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I remember looking at it in midseason last year. And how old was Dermot last season? Like, 21, maybe? Maybe. Maybe 20. Not very old. I think he was 21 in December or something like that. Like, he started the year at 20. And you look at, I remember looking at the list midseason last year. And there were a lot of guys younger than Dermot that were in the NHL as defensemen. So, and if you go back six, seven years ago, there's no 19, 20 year old defenseman in the NHL, hardly any. You know, when Morgan Riley did it and Luke Shen did it, it was kind of an anomaly. Right. Now there's like 20, 22 guys who are doing it every year. And that could just continue to grow. If, especially with the way that they can objectively measure people using the analytics, they might see that a Sandine is better than some defenseman you can sign. Oh, I think there's objectively players that Sandine was better than last year that oh were on the Leafs God, roster. Yeah. I think that that's there's no question you about should, that. I mean, looking at who's been projected to be on the Leafs bottom pair, I think, I'd argue he should make it opening night. Well, and and that was that that's where I want to lead us because well, me, there, there's uncertainty about the Leafs roster. But are the Leafs, this is just a broad question, we'll get into the specifics. Are the Leafs better opening night than they were again in game seven against boston well, are they a better team born wrote about that and i talked about that after the trade was made for barry and i've thought about that in the week since i wrote the story um after the cadre barry trade and i think it's probably the wrong question because they don't necessarily need to be like if they can stay as good as they were last year and just continue to maintain that level and their young players get better i think where they might get better is just internally like they're young they're and then just, the, the cast around them just needs to stay roughly the same ability and then as Matthews and Marner and Nylander and and Dermot and who am I forgetting? Kapanen and Janssen. They've got yeah. like their top line is only locked up forever. They, you know, he'll yeah, get better. They've built this team very very young, and that means that there's still some lift that they're going to get from these guys as they move into whether 22, 23, 24 years old. That could just be how they get better right there. Mm-hmm. And then it doesn't really matter, you know, maybe swapping CC and Barry for Zaitsev and Hainsey. I mean, and and Gardner, you lose as well. Maybe that does end up being a wash, but it doesn't matter because you've got all these young players that are getting better and better. Um, I just I just freak out whenever I see the Harper Hall third pairing that some people have projected. I'm got like, Marincin, too. Oh! <laughs> I'd rather. Marincin is the best name out of the three that we just mentioned. Magic Hands Marty is back for another tour of duty. I'll, t- I'll take Magic Hands Marty, man. I'm actually excited uh, because Holy. Jonas laughs at me, but I've been working on like a big Marincin feature for a long time, oh and when it looked God. like he was going to be back, I was like, oh, I guess I can't ever do that that Marincin feature, and now it's still alive. Oh man! So what are, what are you going to even write about? With oh, him? I just got to get on the plane to Slovakia. And I'm just, oh, no, James. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh I can't God. wait for that. When it does come out, James, we'll, we'll but, make but, sure and promote it. <laughs> like the thing is with our audience is that we found like if you can do a deep dive on like something that like like the globe would never let you do that. No, I could do I could do four thousand words on Marincin and our audience would read it. The hits would be I, out yeah. of this world. I would read it, but I'd also the whole time I'm going, 
how is he still a leaf? How is he still a leaf? But I'm, <laughs> well, I'm well, reading would, to maybe you, find out. You would want that in the story, yeah. 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 Well, like, well, Simeon Dur Argachensev, I don't think, has ever been printed in the Toronto Sun. No. I don't think it's ever made it to, like, a newsprint for well, any Wheeler's newspaper. Wheeler's done four big takeouts on him or something. He yeah. loves him. And now I love him. Yeah. As a result. Well, except he plays for the Pete's. I'm not allowed to love him. I don't think he had a very good year, right? Uh, <laughs> well, dude, he's on the Pete's. Okay. Like, yeah. The Pete's, the Pete's stink. And okay. have stunk for like a long time. Okay. Also, yeah. also, he's an Oshawa fan, so he has to hate the Pete's. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine just also got hired as a, as a play-by-play guy for the Pete's, so hopefully they turn it around. Oh, man, yeah. that sucks for him. <laughs> <laughs> well, he wasn't Swift Current, so I think this might be an upgrade. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I've never been to Swift Current. I don't know. It's small. Oh, okay. Fair enough. I love the Prairie people. I'm from out west, but it's it's just small and cold and. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Not untrue. I think Swift Current's the smallest city that has a major junior team. I think it's like, I think it's under 20,000 people. Is like it? It's really small. Is it really? Yeah. 20,000. So yeah. that's such a great example of the of the prairie. There's nothing to do, but everyone's at the nothing. Yeah. I bet you know that what place I mean? sells out. I bet they are one of the better attended teams. 16,000 people. Yeah. Dude, wow. I, are you serious? Yeah, Sixteen six oh four in two thousand sixteen last census. That Dude, I lived it, man. I grew up in Western Canada in a city where there ain't nothing to do, and we and everyone's we had, at the nothing. We had season tickets. Like <laughs> yeah. when I was a kid, Canvas was probably like seventy five, eighty thousand people, and the arena held fifty five hundred. So that's a pretty big percentage of the city that would be at those games, and it was sold out every every game. If you were like a cat burglar in Kamloops, <laughs> that's the time to strike. <laughs> you just clean out half of Kamloops during every game. Man, you want to jack a car while everybody's at the game? <laughs> yeah, uh, all the cops are there too. Yeah. They're working the game, probably. Oh yeah, my God. it's their overtime. All the co- sorry, the cop. <laughs> no, the sheriff. The sheriff. That's right, <laughs> sheriff. Yes. Hey, there's like 80,000 people. It's not. <laughs> I know. I'm talking about it like it's, it's a current. Swift current. Oh, yeah. dog, it's like the size of Pickering. No. Um, Pickering doesn't have a major junior team. Jeez. No, it doesn't. No, it no. doesn't. Um, you know, I, I. So, one of the things, and, and Steve and I've had this this argument, and, and Jesse rolls his eyes at Steve, as do I, because Steve has. An anxious streak. I'm not sure if you know that. What? Oh. Um, and one of the things that Steve's been freaked out about that I know a lot of people are freaked out about and that we don't quite understand, and I didn't understand the arbitration rules properly, Cody is a really interesting one because the Leafs, from what I understand, didn't have to pay him what they paid him. Correct? I think there were avenues that... I mean, and they, they could have also just traded him, right? Yeah. They or or do, Or do the arbitration thing and walk... Yeah, So what is could. it yeah. that they see in him that they're like, yeah, that probably is our second pair right-handed guy? Part of what they see or is... Or top. No. No, uh, I don't think so. It'll be, no. it'll be Muzzin. Part different. of why they think that he can work is they're going to move him to secondary duty. And I, I think what they see is... they. I think they kind of feel that Ottawa abused him a little bit. We talk about not throwing young players into the fire so much. He had terrible D partners. He was in tough minutes. He was on a bad team. On and on and on and on. The Leafs seem to think that that's why his metrics look the way they do and not necessarily how he plays. And it'll be it'll be fascinating. But I think the point you make is they still could trade him. Maybe they look at him for like October, November, like, and, and then Dermot's healthy and coming back, and it's like, this isn't working. Mm-hmm. But, it's a try, but it's a $4.5 million try where you didn't have to. Yeah, I guess, and I, so they my, think something's there. They legitimately think something's there. Now, do you think there's something there? I don't know. I mean, well, what's your? I mean, <laughs> your opinion matters. I mean, we we yeah. what what do you think? Like in a, in a best case scenario that is still realistic, what are we looking at with this person? And how does he fit on this team? And is Mike Babcock going to use him like he used Ron Hainsey and Roman Pollack? <laughs> there I, it is. I see there there it is. Fear. Hey that's, there, that's, Steve. It's not even Which Cody CC. Steve? It's Mike Babcock's usage of Cody CC. Got to yeah. Name well, I mean, that's and, and what about his usage of Ben Harper? And what Ooh. about you know? <laughs> ben Harper. Yo, can not that guy not make the team, please? Ben oh Harper's God. not going to be. <laughs> There's no way. He's going to be Marley. Well, so who's your? Justin Hall. When Dermot, yeah, and who else? Until Dermot goes Anybody. Back. Magic hands Anybody. Marty. <laughs> I think Harper probably gets a chance as no. like a depth guy. No! <laughs> no! Simply no! Yeah, well, he's your healthy scratch every night. Yeah. Uh, to begin the season, I would think. Uh, but the thing is, like, Babcock's going to look at that guy, and he's like, he's <gasps> big. He's 6'6", six, six, <laughs> plays the six, PK. Six every time, yeah. I just remember? wonder if they'll. I wonder if they'll play him like ten minutes a night, and it'll be like no! the easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, two minutes. I'm not saying. Okay, I'm not saying my opinion. I'm saying I'm trying to forecast what they're gonna do. Yes, yeah. I know, I'm trying to, I know yeah. that. Yeah. Sorry. No. 
Sorry. What do I think CC is? Rule one of broadcasting. Yell at the guests. Sorry. I think I think CC. No, I like I like I enjoy it. It's okay. good. Yep. Yeah, it's better than the yelling at, that I get at home. So, so. <laughs> Oh at least God. this is about hockey. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> See, I think CC is going to be a one-year experiment, and that's mm-hmm. what he's going to be. And okay. That, I mean, the four and a half. I think they look at it like Zaitsev was making four and a half, but we were stuck with that contract for five years. He couldn't move the puck out of his own end very well. CC's better at that, at least. And I imagine they're going to play him with good players. He's going to be on the ice with either the Matthews line or the Tavares line. And, and CC's Riley. role is going to be yeah. CC's role is going to be get one of those other people the puck. Yeah, he <laughs> put up points. He put up some, and points. he might excel was, in that role of just. And maybe they start him in the offensive zone a lot, and maybe they. Dubis, Kyle Dubas would know Cody Cece really well from the OHL. He would have seen him play a lot there. Hmm. I'm the, playing devil's advocate no, because yeah. if you look at why. if you look yeah. at the analytics and everything, they're terrible. Yeah, they really <laughs> yeah. are. There's no escaping that. But and the other thing I think that we got to talk about is that the analytics that the Leafs use are not what we're looking at. They're not looking at that. They're not using that stuff. They're just not. So what are the, they using then? I don't. You got to get get Dubas on here and get him in here. Oh and God! It. Oh, easy. I wish. This totally. is another one where it's like if like if I knew that that we would be that would Marlo's. be a paywall story. And then right, fair <laughs> enough. Okay. <laughs> if, if I had extensive knowledge of the you're, analytic data, they you're would, not dropping that for free. That's that's, that's something that, that that team is going to protect with their life. Okay. Oh my God, God, I were CC. I'm even like, okay, yeah, all right. Maybe. Interesting. I'm I'm willing to give him a shot. Harper, dude. Harper, because he just fits so many Babcockian criteria. And I, I have this bad thing when I'm watching where, when I watch a Leaf game, I'm watching just the one Leafs. Bad thing, huh? I'm watching, yeah, <laughs> shut up. I'm watching what the Leafs do, not necessarily what the other team is doing to them sometimes. So it's difficult for me to notice players on the other team at times. But, you but I remember mid season, I was like, Ben Harper's really bad, right? <laughs> like, this guy, he was just getting walked every single shift. And then I saw he was part of my nightmare trade. When I, oh, Zaitsev's going to Ottawa. Oh, as long as it's not CC, guess what? It's CC and Harper. What? I just lost my mind, man. I think they're going to give him a shot. I, ah! re- I really do. Now... And I don't know if that's just training camp and preseason. Or I don't mm-hmm. think they just acquired that to throw it in the mi- to put him in the minors. Yeah, they I don't anybody. want to call him but it th- to put the contract in the minors. Uh, so then, okay, when oh you God. look at, I, I think we can probably safely say that a very, very, very good, probably Hall of Fame head coach, not probably, definitely Hall of Fame head coach in Mike Babcock, probably coached one of his worst games in, in Boston in Game 7. Is that fair? But enough about 2018. <sighs> <laughs> 2019 <laughs> probably one of at least from my perspective and this is just a personal thing it looked like they were beaten everywhere they were beaten on all fronts bruce cassidy had his number and and, and you know as you said as you tweeted and i will never forget this tweet i, I don't know why it sticks out of my mind patrick marlowe on the ice in the last couple minutes well, I remember watching the end of that game in the press box and being like, "What is going on?" Like they're, it, it just and the players are would just look like they were done too. Like they just, they the Leafs I think have to be careful because you know you're going to lose player confidence if there's stuff like that happening. And it's going to be really interesting when Babcock finally talks at the beginning of the year because he he's one of the people that vouched for Zaitsev and brought him over from Russia and advocated for him to get that contract. He's one of the people that recruited Marlow and advocated for him to get that contract. Some of the things that were wrong with the Leafs roster weren't just the coach playing those players. He helped them be part of the team. I didn't know about uh, Mike Babcock with Marlow. Oh, I, yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. Well, yeah, he coached him, he right, was, with the Olympic team? He, yeah, and the World he Cup was team. all in on, on bringing Marlow aboard. Re- okay. that, was, that was a Lamorello-Babcock decision. That, wow. which was the brain trust at the time when that contract was signed. So there have been some mistakes that have been made that the coaching staff, the coach, the head coach, has had an influence in. And now I'm not in the room to know who's making what argument and who's making what decision. But I I'm think sure that, you could deduce it, though. You're yes, around them yeah. enough. Yeah. That's, Is this a that's, paywall question? Does he have a lot of <laughs> <laughs> impact in the signings? I, I, think he I, think he had, I think he had a lot of... I think Lou Lamorello really respected Mike Babcock, understandably, and I think that he took his opinion on some of these personnel decisions into account. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, one of the things that we thought... T- uh, Sid Six Zero actually tweeted it, and I was definitely thinking, is like he, he said after that last game, Mike Babcock's coach's last game with the Leafs. 
And and you said no, and I, I even at the time I was like I was so mad I was like that's got to be it that's got to be it this was crap. But then you look at the, the the history and he's done such an amazing job he really has especially that first season and that second season with the bunch of nobodies and then the bunch of rookies, and it just seems like there's a there seems to be a wall with him where he just won't commit to coaching this team the way they're constructed. And Kyle Duba said at the end of the season that everybody was up for review. And then a few days later, he's met with Babcock. They've had a conversation. He said the conversations were very productive. Do you think that means that Mike Babcock is willing to change or willing to look at changing the way he's deploying these players? Because this is a this is a team that is the antithesis of what Mike Babcock want, wanted to coach. He wants tough. He wants some skill, lots of like high end skill, but he also wants the Abdul Kader fourth line for some reason. Well, that's what I was going to say is that he has no choice but to change now. Like, look how much different the roster is. He what a bit? Who, who is, who's going to be his Marlowe, Hainsey, Zaitsevs this year? Like ben Harper, can't, Cody, can't wait to yeah. find out. Jason <laughs> can't wait to find out, James. Ben, CC. Who are the three worst players? Those ones. Spets, Spets against That's who it's going to be. Yeah. Jason Spets is on the first line. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Austin Matthews is going to sit. It's Jason Spets will not make the opening night lineup because it'll be go. <laughs> oh, it'll be Freddie. It's, it'll be let, me, let me put it this way. It's getting harder and harder. It, it's much harder for him now to do what he did last year. Like, there's no Patrick Marlowe you can give 15 minutes a game. There's no you, playing, with, Brown. playing with Austin Math. Yeah, there's no Connor Brown. That's Yeah, that's another good one. You know, they've gotten rid of a lot of... The, the fat, the comfort goats. Who who can't? I can't. I think I think Tyler Dello called them comfort goats. Like these kind of players <laughs> that make the coach goats. make the coach a comfort goats. Like I think they use them. Uh, I don't know. I can't remember the reference, but I it's it's a good one. I think Connor Brown was used wrong. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like yeah. I actually think he'll, he'll work be fine out in Ottawa. Ottawa. Yeah, yeah. He's, I thought he's he was going to go to Edmonton. I like I th- Same. I thought the Oilers should have ponied up and. I well, think was it going to be Benning? Like it was going to be nothing to get yeah. him. Yeah, like. It was, I think it was it. like a pick, and Holland doesn't want to trade picks, and but they should have they should have gotten him in there. Oh, Hutton. there you go, Hutton. <laughs> no. Remember that? Oh my god. Um, yeah, no, it, it seems that it seemed like he would have been great. And imagine James Neal, Connor McDavid, and uh, Connor Brown. That sounds like a good line to me. Connor Brown was misused, but he also didn't really fit with what the Leafs had, right? Like he wasn't really, and I think he'll fit better in another. Another team. Just and the way the, the Leafs are built on speed and skill, and we'll always have that tip-in goal, though. Yeah, <laughs> against Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah. so, so good. But well, Connor Brown's such a good dude too. Like, is you know, he was one of the best people in that dressing room, and it's, you know, I, I, I th- like there was, n- they didn't want to trade him. He's making two point one million dollars, and he's on the fourth line. I just. They need that money. Do you, it's there's no cap. It's not even a bad deal. It's no. just where he was. If, in the... if there's no cap, that he never gets traded. Yeah. No, they never. keep him forever. They would just yeah. I wonder. Um, I wonder with 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 Mike Babcock. You know, you you say that he's running out of options, right? In, in terms of how he's going to coach the team. Do you really think, or is that being devil's advocate, James? Or no, is that no, being... I no. I mean, they they took away Brown, Marlowe, Hainsey, Zaitsev. And and is this Kyle Dubas planting his flag in the earth and going, no, this is what we're going to be, get on board or get out? I think Kyle Dubas is doing what he thinks he, needs, he has to do to win. And I'm sure he was sick and tired of watching Zaitsev and Hainsey. And that's, that's not the kind of hockey that Kyle Dubas has always wanted his teams to play. He wants them to be able to move the puck efficiently. And like you, you could go in and watch the Marlies and then watch they, the way they were playing and, and watch players like Justin Hall and that fit in in the AHL environment. And then the Leafs weren't doing the same thing. Just and part of it was personnel. Mm-hmm. This was always, I think, what Kyle Dubas was going to do. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a Babcock thing. Interesting. Yeah, it just makes the most sense. Which to me, even more says there's a disconnect, right? Yeah. Oh, there's a disconnect. He was always going to do this. Well, then that's even worse. So, is there a scenario right? where Mike Babcock doesn't make it through the season? I don't think so. I don't think I so. Do. You do. Right. Why do they, you think? they would have to be just brutal. Like they yeah. would have to be. Bad. Out of a playoff spot, mm-hmm. they like something would have to go seriously wrong. I'm not if he even had sure, his, it would have to be let, that bad. Let's say he's got a clean slate, and Mike Babcock's contract ended June thirtieth. Who's his coach this year? Yeah. Next year? Like, who's the guy? Who, what's uh, the type of coach that that? I mean, Steve McFarland's the new assistant, obviously. Paul. Pa- sorry, Paul McFarland. <laughs> uh, I don't know why I keep saying Steve McFarland. And then you've got Dave Haxtall, which was interesting. I um, wonder if that was a Babcock input, or I don't know. I don't know. I well, know. I'd be surprised if Mike Babcock was allowed to put input into something like well, that. Well, normally a coach gets some input into their staff. I mean, okay. McFarland was obviously yeah. someone that, that Dubas would have known. 
McFarlane, he went to high school with Jonas Siegel. So. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Is there a feature coming? Yes. Ah. Oh. Hey. <laughs> there you go. I won't ask what it's about. That'll yeah, be behind the paywall. Yeah, for, right. yeah, further questions directed to the paywall. <laughs> 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 Subscribe today. 40% Here, can off. I, can I read 40. it now? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have it. I haven't seen it yet. We need Jonas to get back to work. Yeah, right? Oh, What's he been doing? <laughs> it's not like that guy works hard. Come on. <laughs> All the hockey writers go to like Mars. I for I don't two blame months. them. I would need to disappear forever. Hey, we still got lots of content going. Oh yeah. Hell yeah. Oh, I uh. didn't say the athletic necessarily. <laughs> I mean, you're here. That's me. Um, I'm working on a leaf story. Hoping to have something for Wednesday. What are you thinking? What is it? I'm, I'm going to do something looking at their cap situation and what their roster looks like, like into the into the future, like mm-hmm. trying to like spitball. Like they have some money next year, do they not? Yeah. But and, they, and but, one defenseman. Yeah, but they have no. <laughs> but they all all their D is UFA. So right. Mm-hmm. That's kind of what I want to get into is is like looking at, um, and and like even looking beyond that, like does it, does this cap situation ease up a little bit? The cap not going up very much is really limiting for them because if it continued going up three or four million dollars a year, you can project where that would be three years from now, and obviously they got lots of space and they're always going to be spending to that limit. So if it gets stifled like this, it's it's really tough because well, I'm sure when they signed the Matthews contract, they were like. Well, we're gonna have an eighty-three million cap next year, and then it's gonna be eighty-six, and then it's gonna be. And it's like, no, the projections are wrong. Like, it's not gonna happen that way. Interesting that they didn't. The NHL is yeah. making more money than ever. I'm surprised. It's that an it escrow would go to the thing. Players. It's escrow. So they didn't want to vote for the escalator, basically, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that what sense. that's what happened. Yeah. yeah they they should have, they should have been doing that like five six years ago. I mean, every time I talked to players about this, I was always like, why? Like, you don't like escrow? Then stop voting to raise right. the cap artificially. Because the escrow was at whatever it was. Was it 10 11% or something last yeah, year? Yeah. So the lot. value of your contract is not real. If you're a player making $10 million, you're actually making eight point nine or whatever. Does it it's, never come back? No. If, if you a- lose your escrow, then, then, then it's gone. Oh, wow. Escrow is an adjustment mechanism based on how well revenues match up with how much teams are spending. Wow. So, so the, then they balance out at the end of every year. Yeah. Okay. And I'm the players lose that, that big chunk of their contract. Oh, wow. Yeah. The players I had no idea it worked like that. Ever agreeing to that is shocking. Do you uh, have the same fear as Steve in that you see a lockout coming? Maybe a short one, but I don't think it's going to be Armageddon. I don't know what we're going to do no. with like 50 hockey writers at the Athletic <laughs> if there's, there's no hockey. We're all going to be in swift current right yeah, now. Yeah, all right. <laughs> well, you could have some fun with that, right? Like, well, I think what we talked about last time is what we would do. We would just switch to the KHL and, and learn about the KHL because it's a wild, Not crazy a place. Not a single sober show. No. <laughs> Not no. one. No. Yeah, we'd have fun watching people cancel subscriptions. Oh. oh. <laughs> oh no, gosh. I don't think so. I... I James, the the uh, yeah, and then they come back as soon as the lockout ends, and you jack the price. The one thing that I um, that I I really I look at the roster and I go ah, this is a little bit concerning. Is the um, is a backup goaltender situation because yep. it's very clear yet again as it was before that Freddie Anderson can't play as many games as he's played. Can't it's wait just, to it's see just, them not address this as well. It's a it's a it's a they must know at like. Performance-wise, how many games a goalie should play? What a bit, right? I'm sure it's fifty games, fifty-five maybe. Well, we, I mean, we've seen. I mean, look at the year Tuka Rask had, where they dialed like Boston specifically went into the year saying we're going to get a good backup goalie, we're going to pay Halak two and a half million dollars, we're going to allocate that money on our cap. Uh, and look at the year Rask had in the playoffs. I mean, he was just he was a different goalie than he was in other postseasons when he held them back. And I remember in that first round series. The fan base and the media in Boston were really hard on Rask and were really getting on him. And then he just had a great postseason. And, you know, people were talking about, you know, he could be the, the Conn Smythe guy. Um, I think you're right. I mean, I think that the sweet spot for goalie, and I think as as analytics take over more and more, you're probably going to see goalies play less and less. And they're going to top out around 50, 52 games. Anderson, 66 games his first year, 66 games his second year, 60 games last year. And part of that's because he got hurt around December last year. Because of course he did, because he's playing sixty plus games. That that's one of those. I don't. I don't have a devil's advocate answer on this one because I don't like what they're doing. And what what are they what are they doing that you don't like? I don't know what what's the option here. Like well, they, I they, think, they got I think they should on a PTO, right? That was today. Yeah, I mean I, that's from like a European source. I didn't. I don't know. Did anyone confirm uh, that? This? Nobody's confirmed. No, yet. but even if it's true, it's magic beans. Right, like that's a guy who was a. Confident. Is he any better than Hutchinson? Like I don't know. He he Might was be. he was better, but he played I think eight hockey games last year. Right, and and not very none well. None of them were good. Yeah, right. He was he was hurt, and then there was Hutchinson, who prior to coming to tr- uh, to Toronto was terrible. And are any of those guys better than Garrett Sparks? Who was bad? 
Who and the Leafs basically no, kicked him off. Their the backup team. goalie spot right now is a giant question mark. Like it's, it's t- and and like I've always argued that teams should allocate more resources there. I think what Boston did was brilliant. And so like it's it, the Leafs are in a tough spot where they got to pick what they're going to do. I I just think they should have went and got some backup goalie who was decent for like a million and a half and just like spent some of that cap space as opposed to like I said there's not a lot of fat to trim but you know maybe you can find a little bit of room somewhere else Mm -hmm. um and obviously you know the big story that we're probably gonna have to wait till uh training camp for is Mitch Marner and there's a lot of angles to this story yeah how long have we talked we haven't talked yeah I know I'm trying it's good that we haven't talked about it and if people (laughs) if people go look we're not writing about this all the time like we're not no, I mean it's we we're tired of talking about it. I'm tired of the Neil stuff. There's nothing to say. Yeah. There's nothing like I'm not writing a story. He did his Marner did his charity event and there were a bunch of stories and there's nothing to say. And like, what was he going to say? He's not going to say anything. No, and he like, See the kid at Wonderland? No, what happened? The, the kid's like, "Here, uh, Mitch, let, let's take a selfie." And then it ended up being a video. He's like, "When are you going to resign?" And no. Mitch is like, "Ah." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. But like if James, how do you see it playing out? And there's a couple other follow-up questions I'll have, but how do you see this playing out? If I'm the Leafs, I start in early September, I start, or even late August, I start leaking trade rumors of, you know, the Leafs are talking to so-and-so about Mitch Marner, and they got to put the fear into him a little bit that he might not be here. And that, do you see that, a scenario where he may not be? Yeah, I think it's possible. I think he's going to be here, but they need his side. They, they need, like, some sort of reasonable negotiation to happen to get a contract done. And why hasn't it been? Why is this agent, and it seems to be the agent, this is the agent's mo. This is what he does. He did it with the fantasy. He did it with uh, Anderson. Josh Anderson. Yeah, Josh Anderson and and I think uh, Bennett in Calgary or no? Who was it? Well, he's got he's got Bennett now. Was it was he with Johnny Gaudreau when all that happened? No, no, no. Uh, actually, Nylander's agent is Gaudreau's agent. Oh, Louis Gross. Oh, oh, Louis oh, Gross is, okay. is Gaudreau's agent. That's yeah. So why? What is the? Because I've been really hard on this guy. He he has fallen flat on his face several times now in the media trying to negotiate through the media. He's clearly trying to put fan pressure on the team. This hasn't worked. Leaf fans... Well, the offer sheet thing hasn't worked either. There's so, no... so what is this... What is the, what's the strategy now? Because he's got no leverage. There's no lever point here other than Mitch Marner's talent, which is obvious. So if you're the agent and this is your, your playbook and it's the same playbook every time, do you think a guy like Kyle Dubas isn't going to find that out? And secondly, if Mitch Marner is not a Leaf at the end of this because of they've been asking this obnoxious number, which we hear is $12.5 million or $11.5 million, which is still crazy. Oh, yeah, according Anyone to Darren. Well, if you, wanna, if you want to ask Darren Drager, it could be the moon. The, 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 what is the end game for him? How, as an agent, do you win this? Because you've sold the Marner family, and specifically, Mitch, people, people, people always say it's Paul Marner. We don't know if Paul Marner is involved in this at all, and I think it's unfair to, to include him in this. Um... How do you how do you now go back to the client and go, yeah, we can't get anywhere close to that? Sorry, I, it's gonna have to be nine and I, a half. I personally believe that Mitch wants to stay and that whatever the resolution is, he's gonna be fine with and he's gonna be like he I he wants to be here. Of course he does. He's not he does not want to go play for the Islanders. Like it's just not Like and even if they did offer him a deal, does he sign it? Well that's it. He has to in order for this to like for that to actually be a threat. Yeah. So it, it's such a silly situation because, like, if it was a different environment and it was, like, the Truba and Winnipeg situation where he doesn't want to be there, mm-hmm. and there are various reasons why he doesn't want to be there, okay, like, I understand playing this level of hardball. and But with Marner, it makes no sense because... Th- so if I'm the Leafs, I, the, you got to put that, that thread out there that potentially you could get moved, that potentially your dream scenario, you grew up wanting to play for the Leafs, it's your hometown team, you're a star, you're one of their best players... What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, and what's the difference? And and people, I get I get lit up for saying this, but it's the truth. Um, and you can back me up on this because I know you know it a little bit better than I do. Um, the money making potential outside of the Toronto Maple Leafs organization in this city, I think, is greater than anywhere else in the NHL. Oh, well, I like, mean, we, look at the endorsements that Marner has. Like, look how many like commercials any- you see him on, and like, look at. I mean, so if he loses a million bucks on or two million bucks a season, he can make that up in endorsements, can oh, he not? Oh, 100%. And especially if he continues to be a big part of this team and they win and they, because they become, like they go on a run, I don't want to say like the Raptors because that's that's not just a run, that's a that's that's something <laughs> it's different. A, but almost a miracle. Yeah, yes. But 
you know, if the Leafs continue to be good and he continues to be part of that and he has 94-point seasons again and again and again, he can write his own ticket off the ice. Like, it doesn't... And and the other and on the ice, too. I mean, at some point, he's going to come up for another contract. I think his camp, like, they should just sign a show-me deal, sign a two- or a three-year contract, and then the Leafs are not going to have much... If he, if he has 94 points for the next three years... He's gonna, whatever he wants. He's going to make whatever... Yeah. He will make more than Austin. Yeah. Because yeah. with yes. inflation... Yeah, there won't to. be much choice. Yes, and, and there will be more cap space, and there will be. Is that really and the, the Leafs issue? will probably happily pay it? Right. right. Is that really the issue? Is it, it? Does it have to be more than Austin? Is that why? I don't. I don't talk to. I don't talk to the the father. I mean, that's Jonas. Is, does, is the father and, involved? Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. Everybody so knows that. I wasn't sure. I'd never got confirmation on. I don't like involving people in the story if they're not. If like I felt like what, what happened with Michael Nylander last year was perhaps a little bit unfair. And I wanted to be careful with, with Paul. So, I mean, obviously we read Jonas's piece with Paul. Mm-hmm. And then we heard the interview that he did basically walking back all the claims that he made in The Athletic on TSN later that afternoon when it all came out. Oh. Ferris did, yeah. Ferris, yeah. Ferris did, yeah. But so I mean, wait, was that, was Paul that, Marner did too. Was that uh, Jonas that uh, Had Aaron the Paul Ferris Marner. did the big uh, blow up on the same day Matthew signed his extension? No, he also had the piece with the, in the Star where they, yeah, how did that, that go was over? On the, but we had one earlier than that where it had Paul Marner in it and it had Ferris in it, and I know. remember that. And he one. said that those was quotes huge. were from the summer, and they came out. Yeah, like that's December. what I mean. Like Paul came, went on ten fifty and you know, walked but, back all of those claims. Well, those quotes are old. I think it was yeah. the agent though. It wasn't the dad. Yeah, it was, I oh, was it? I, yeah, okay. I didn't hear the dad on the radio. The, yeah, he didn't. Paul didn't. Go on. But didn't Paul the agent say something specifically referring to the deal he got? I thought he did. In in the star story, oh okay. Okay. yes, yeah, okay. On well, the I, day on the day they announced the contract, and it's like it was a huge day for Austin Matthews personally and and for the team to to do that to throw an egg on that day was well. How did that very go over unusual? In the least dressing room. Well, I don't. know. I'm not. <laughs> I, I mean, mean, I technically am in there sometimes, but I'm not in there when they. There's no way that. I, the thing is, is that Mitch and Austin are really close. Like they're they're good friends. They want to play together. Like I think that like. They want to play on the same line. Like, they want to be on the top power play unit together. They want, you know, they don't want this to end badly. None of them do. Mm-hmm. So I think that the piece I wrote during the season is that essentially that there's this dark cloud around Mitch Marner that he doesn't deserve at all. I don't think it's of his doing. I think that there's people around him giving him bad advice. And what do you think that bad advice would be? I'm not asking for, like, exact word, but what what is the... Because Elliot Friedman said something like that similarly on the on the Thirty One Thoughts well, podcast. Well, this whole negotiation and like the way that they've put it out in the public eye and everything like that's because it seems to be about respect, right? I guess I, I don't think Marner's been disrespected though. Well, no, he's, he didn't he's get, beloved. He didn't yeah. get to play on a line with P.A. Parento when he was a rookie. <laughs> <laughs> he, he didn't get to play on a line with P.A. Parento when they intentionally finished last, and that was a slap in the face, James. That's what he wanted. That's yeah, what they said for sure. That was one of the things that was named on the rookie bonuses and uh, him having to play on the fourth line for eight games with his buddy Matt Martin. And like, and I don't think Mitch. This is this. One, none of this seems to affect games, Mitch Marner. One of those games on the fourth line, he put up like four points. Well, exactly. <laughs> and this is the weird thing is that you you mentioned it. The yeah, we put up four points. Actually, made the fourth line viable, but none of that seemed to affect Mitch. What seems to affect Mitch. Or what seemed to affect the Marner camp is is every slight that Paul Marner and uh, and Darren or uh, yeah uh, Darren Ferris have written down. It's like uh, Chris Jericho in the WWE. He's like you're on the list, <laughs> and it's what I don't I, I just don't understand where the win for those two is. What are they trying to win? And is and and it, Mitch Marner's a man now. He's got to be responsible for the people that represent him. So at what point does he step in and go, you know what, guys, this isn't really my style. I want to be here. I can make an obnoxious amount of money anyway. Why don't we just make this happen? Does he do that? I don't know. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet, right? Right. And I don't I don't know. I don't know how that, like, I'm not in that inner dynamic. I just know, you just hear from people around it mm-hmm. how it functions. Okay. But I think that he's getting bad advice, and I think he's a good kid. I think he wants to stay here. And I think that... You know, a lot of players don't... Nylander was the same way. They want their agent to handle this negotiation because they don't understand where they fit in. They don't understand what their value is. So when you talk about bad advice, that's all part of it, right? They're handing a lot of this over for them to handle. Right. Austin Matthews wasn't deciding his... He wasn't pounding the table asking for what number the number he got. 
His representatives are doing that. Right. Right. Interesting. Well, I mean, sorry, I don't. I know I wanted to save the Marner stuff as later as, as late as we could because I know everybody's sick and tired of talking about it. But it just for me save, seems save like till, uh, training camp. there is no <laughs> win here for this agent now. He has done everything he can to exhaust every single well, angle. I don't see it. He probably did. He probably will if he does sign in Toronto. He probably succeeded in getting him more than we would have thought. And so at a cheaper price than we thought. It's it's almost at the point where no matter what he signs for, it's whoo. You know, at least it wasn't eleven. I don't know. I think there's going to be a mixed reaction. Yeah, like like Austin's. I, I think it's going to be like everybody's unhappy. Is is probably where it's going to end up oh, if good. it gets done. That's the perfect compromise. Everybody's <laughs> sort of unhappy. <laughs> Nobody wins outright. Like, where's your line for what would make you unhappy on a Marner contract? What if it's like five years, ten point seven? Do you like that? It's what I said with Austin. Like, uh, I don't love 11.6, but I do love the fact that he's on my team for the next half decade. For the best half decade of his career. Yeah. So, right, so five years, I don't care. I I like that Mitch Marner will be on my team for five years. So ultimately, I won't be that upset. I think it's going to be... But that's too much money. I know. I'm not, I, I actually don't think it's going to be that much. I mean, if, if the Leafs get in a situation where it's much more than 10, things are so tight. I don't know how they're going to make that work. Well, Nick Patan, they might have to swallow that contract and do something with. They just won't be able to carry anybody. On, on the, they, they won't have their taxi squad. Right? They might strap them to a rocket. Like people have been making fun of the Oilers for all the bottom six guys that they have. The Leafs have a lot. The Leafs have like six lines mm-hmm. <laughs> right now, and there's all these guys. Okay, maybe you have the inside track on this. Um, who is it? Agostino. I can't. And Shore? T- I can't talk about it, Steve. It's <laughs> no. No. What? Well, do, do those guys exist? Because they haven't even been announced yeah, yet. Yeah, they're going to be part of the team. Okay, that's weird. <laughs> Here, wait. Let me, let me get out my... Uh, wait, oh, you've already that, paid. You just gotta... <laughs> <laughs> this is the awkward thing about doing a show like this. This is the awkward thing about doing a show like this in the middle of summer is that yeah. there's all these things that are half... Right. Like all these half things we're working on that are half finished. That... How do I get it fully finished? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I like the I can't talk about it, though. That's so you, you're, what you're saying <laughs> is we should have another tier at The Athletic where you can like... It, where I just... Just hand you money in person. Yeah. And you tell me things. <laughs> he follows you to Leafs games and just hands you twenty. <laughs> but yes, Agostino and Nick Shore are Leafs. Okay, okay, okay. Good, but not officially announced until what? Mitch Marner, and Probably. also Nick Patan, and also Jason Spezza, and also Freddie Goche. <laughs> yeah, but like those guys that make under a million, like the Leafs can just like doesn't maybe the Marlies will be really good, right? <laughs> I yeah, think I think you I called think it a taxi squad. They're literally going to be taking a taxi from the Rico to the ACC every day because you save whatever it is like four grand a day if they're when they're down. So, so I think the lease would do that. So this really gets into the nitty gritty. Um, oh, I love I love it. You love the nitty gritty. Let's, let's do so it. Forget about the star player making too much money or not. Why do the Leafs always have um, two spares up front and a spare? On D, they but don't. They don't always have that. No, though. no. Well, when there, guys are actually there hurt. were times last year where they would only have two spares, or sometimes only one. There were some games. Yeah, because well, because there's no need for it. Next year they're going to have to do that. Yeah, they ha- they just can't have cap. three. They, yeah, because the cap. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and they don't use them. <laughs> yeah, you can't have three spares. You need you need a spare on the road though, because it happens actually pretty frequently that totally someone fair. you're on some road trip and you're in Carolina or whatever, and someone gets hurt and it's like or they're sick four hours or they're yeah, sick, yeah the four yeah. or five hours before the game. You can't have no spares on the road. Yeah. Totally, fair. You, but Justin absolutely. Hall seems like the perfect guy for that. <laughs> <laughs> Just put, poor, put him in on the right wing. There, in the there's fourth no time. way that he's going to want to do that again. <laughs> there's no way. Does and that's Justin another have a choice. That's another story that I need to flesh out and like I need to figure out like like is does this guy have a role or not? All right. Well, I, you can write a book, just guys Babcock never played, and just write a chapter each on chapters, each one. Yeah, yeah. Here's Peter Holland. Here's Josh Levo. Here's Frankie Corrado. Here's oh Justin Hall. Come on down. You're the new guy. Who's it going to be this year? Can't wait to find out. Might be Justin Hall. What does a Mitch Marner trade look like? Uh, Thank you, Jonas. It, it, Jonas. This is the kind of thing Jonas and I yell at it about it. Um, he says you can't trade him because you will never get anything back that will make that a good trade for the Leafs. That's probably right. true. Yeah. But wow. if you traded for a need, like what if it's an Aaron Eckblad coming back? Just right. Throwing out it's there. also that's, that's $11 million, million dollars in a, cap. That's the kind of, yeah, that's the kind of thing I say. Like you could trade him for a very good player who makes a little bit less than what Marner's going to get. Then you've got cap space and you've still got a very good player that maybe fits on a piece of part of your roster that you need more help in. I think, like there, it still I think there are ways to do it that make sense. Um, mm. 
what what I've heard a lot of is, well, fine, sign the offer sheet. I'll take those four first round picks. There's no way you would take those four first round picks, would you? How big's the number? Thirteen. So who are you going to trade to fit a thirteen million dollar deal onto the Leafs long term? Yeah, you're going to have to shed other players, dude. If it's ten six, mm-hmm. I take it. Oh, sorry. Hey. Yeah, why did I go thirteen? Yeah, if it's ten six, you take it because I don't. I just don't think four first round picks is worth it for Mitch Marner. But it's also the cap no. space. Yeah. But if you're at thir- it's also the cap space, but, but, but there's Steve, no one available. The, the first number you is, is is the right point. If it's thirteen, let's say some team offers thirteen over four years because they're just like trying to just screw the Leafs, screw yeah. the Leafs as much as possible, and they do it the day before you have to be cap compliant. <laughs> you know, the day before. Jesus. The, the That's day before. A funny. That this is be fun. Funny. The day, <laughs> yeah, there you fun. go. There the, you go. The day after training camp ends and you got to get down to your 23-man yeah. roster. I mean, obviously they get some time where they get to decide on that offer sheet, but then you'd have to you'd have to trade other players to make that fit. I think there are scenarios where well, I mean, in that situation it would be really hard to take the picks because you'd all of a sudden you'd have this huge amount of cap space. What are you going to do with it like it on like October 1st? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. But if you're another team that that wants to go after the Leafs or or Tampa with Point or Kyle Connor and Line A with Winnipeg or you know Tampa with Point is the guy that I would if I've got the cast base that's the guy I want. Right. Now he said he doesn't want to leave and don't even bother. But I think if you came at him with fourteen or fifteen million, he might go. <laughs> ah. Well, and his agent's the same as Aho, and Aho signed an offer sheet, so. And and by the way, is is Mark Bergevin working with Don Waddell because that seemed like a big favor that he just. Did. I don't know what they were doing. I don't know what they that was were. Weird. Uh, you know what? I I laughed yeah. when I Dom for us uh, did a story on the best value contracts around the league, and Ahos was on there. <laughs> <laughs> he was at the new, the new contract. Yeah, yeah, it was wow. one of the most. It was one of the best value contracts in the NHL. How I, long is I, it? I, yeah, it's amazing. How long is his deal again? Wasn't it a five year? I think it was a five. Eight and a half times five. Yeah, eight point oh. four something. Oh. Yeah. It's Beautiful. Fantastic. I, I remember being like, all right, you know what? It's going to suck if Ajo goes to the Habs because they're going to be a really good team. What's the number? And then no, we see the number. I'm like, it's like no, what a waste of time. No. 8.45. And this, I don't know why they got this idea that Carolina wouldn't be able to pay that, too. Like, Well, they're they're a cap team now. I mean, they've got a couple dead cap spaces on there. owner with a lot of money. Yeah. No, they, like, have, they have an owner who lit a lot of money on fire for that football league that yeah. <laughs> was not a problem for him. So why would an offer sheet that's front-loaded be a problem for him? For one player. Yeah, their yeah. best player. Like they they weren't going to take the picks. I don't like that was the most pointless offer sheet I've ever seen. <laughs> Plus, I think with the home playoff games, revenue and everything else, I think Carolina is going to make money pretty here pretty soon here. Well, maybe not, but I think that their <laughs> owner can lose money. Like, yeah, it doesn't matter. Well, doesn't some matter. some of those teams, like I remember seeing the books for like the Coyotes when they were going through their bankruptcy, and it's like holy cow, this team makes like it generates no revenue. Well, I went to uh, I, I've said this on the show before. I went to Arizona for my honeymoon. And I asked the person who we were renting the car from, who, by the way, upgraded us uh, to a, a Mustang convertible because it was our honeymoon, which was awesome. Well, very nice. I oh, said, fun. so, like, how close is the, uh, are the Coyotes arena? And she's like, excuse me? I said, you know, where the Coyotes play. She said, I don't know what the Coyotes are. I'm like, <laughs> I'm staring at the city that they play in. And she's like, I, <laughs> they I'm, like, I'm like the hockey team. She's like, oh, hockey. Um, hockey. And, <laughs> and uh, she's like, yeah, I've never seen them. I don't know. It's far. It is far. Yes. It's in Glendale. It's not in the city. No, lo- it's not yeah. in the city we're looking at. No. Exactly. No, it's not. Exactly. Wow. But it's still one of those where you kind of Carolina's books aren't like like Coyotes, but like there are definitely the revenue parity or disparity in the NHL is pretty crazy. It's not. But like there's a, equalization payments for that. Isn't yeah, there? but not enough to like really. The revenue share is not that big, but the Leafs do pay a lot into that. I can imagine. I would think so. At least probably put thirty million into that every year. Cool. Wow. Oh, cool. 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 So hard cap, and they pay for everything, and none of the benefits. That's they great. get nothing for it. Cool. That's, cool. 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 That's cool, okay. Cool. That's okay. Love Listen, it. if what? the Leafs Love are it. as good this year as they were last year, I think they make it. What? I think they make it further than like imagine. They're as as good this year as they like one one game literally separated them from. Do you think they roll Columbus? Yeah, I think they would probably have a pretty good run. Yeah, it's tough, right? Because no, probably no Hyman and probably, well, I don't know about Gardner. Gardner would have eventually fallen apart. Like yeah. two And Dermot, Dermot wasn't right either. Dermot no, wasn't right. That third pair that the Leafs had was not functional. And they didn't have like a lot of other options. And watching them, they just, yeah. 
Do you think guys like Sandin and Lilligren make the team this year? Or do they really believe that they're going to put them in the Marlies one more? I, I just don't I, see how that's possible. I think one of them gets called up midseason the same way Dermot was for the last 37 games of the year. And that's when they start to integrate those guys. I think one of them will come up. And who's the better player? San, I think Sandin is, but he's a left shot. And then, so then it gets into more... What Mike wants. It gets into more... And the injuries are going to be a factor. And what happens with CC and... All of these things. Okay. I mean, I can see Logan fitting in really nice on the third pair on, on the right side, and that's he, maybe he finishes the season with the Leafs. Do you think... Pe- people have given him a lot of shit lately because Leafs Twitter is, is hard on everybody, but they've given him a lot of shit because it seems like he came in with this fanfare, like, holy crap, this is a guy that fell out of the top three because he had mono. They got him at 17. That's amazing. But he hasn't made the lineup yet, so therefore he's a bust. Where is... What's his projection to you? Uh, and we're not going to hold you to this, by the way. So, yeah. I will. but like <laughs> other people will, I think probably he probably tops out as like a number four D. Like I don't think he's going to be like a game changing top pair D, and I don't think he's going to be a big points producing producing guy either. So, but I think he's going to play in the NHL. They sure could use that, just a top four guy. Yeah, literally as guy, just guy who can make defensive zone exits, like like get the puck. Guy out who's not zone. making four and a half. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> All right, so um, James, uh, we love that you've come. You've come by. We are going to do a quick press conference thing, so we can open it up to uh, our listeners. Do we? Do we have some questions? I'm sure, I can bring some up. Uh, Jesse's going to make up some press conference questions. <laughs> He's going to just make them up. So James, is there a is there a calendar for the amount of stories that you need to do this summer? Like, did you go into the summer and go, I'm going to do it's it's eight weeks until like that pre training camp or the rookie camp or whatever. Uh, I'm going to do eight stories. Well, nobody look because I've hardly written anything because we've been so busy behind the scenes with what we're doing. So, um, but you are you are kind of the manager, so you can say like yes, that. yeah. And I'm not and I'm not just making it up either. <laughs> a lot of that stuff has taken a lot of time. Uh, I, 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 I ideally I would want to write something like once a week, but I've got vacation in there and stuff like that too. So, mm-hmm. but we're trying to keep our hockey staff active in the summer in writing. Yeah. Most of the other outlets don't. There's no hockey writers writing right now. Well, so. there's a hunger for it. I actually saw a traditional media guy say, well, there, there's like a Leafs thing at the end of the year for rookies. Isn't that the nutritional, like educational camp or something like that? Oh, or, uh, They have a development camp. Yeah. In, yeah, so in July, right the end of June, yeah. So, so this, this angry old guy was tweeting about how upset he was that any outlet would dare cover that because it's not even news. Someone local? Someone here? Local, yeah. You you, you can guess. I think and we had four people there at the Leafs <laughs> <laughs> Develop, <laughs> development camp. But, so he must have been really angry. But yeah, that's just oh. that's just like a license to print content, though, because you have... Well, obviously there's no one there, so you have more time with these guys, but it's also guys you're not going to see for a while. You've never spoken to them before because they're brand new, so you can ask them about their whole life story. It's really smart to be at content-wise. And people want to hear about it. Well, one of the things we've seen at The Athletic that does really well is prospect coverage. Like, yeah. yeah. People love that stuff. I was telling people uh, when I wrote about them a little bit more on uh, Sportsnet's website, that sort of 2016 team when all they were doing was just prospect farming. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the numbers were unbelievable. It was, like, more than, like, I'd get something for a Tobias Lindbergh profile that was, like, more than, like, Raptors game recaps. Yeah. Back then. Yeah. They're better now. Yeah, Raptors so are better now. One thing we've been doing in our press conferences lately is trivia. So we asked Ooh. our listeners to give us some hockey trivia to ask oh, on the show. Man, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how good you are at hockey. I trivia. hope I don't look like a fool. <laughs> <laughs> it really depends what it is, like what era and all that. So there are fourteen jersey numbers that have only been ever worn by one Leaf. So I'm going to give you a number. You have to tell me the only Leaf who has ever worn that number. Okay. okay. You guys ready? You can combine your brains. Okay, so we're working together. Yes. Okay, good. 96. He wore it in 2003. Oh, I remember this. <laughs> was the, that? With the, with the, with the, they had, that's when they're, the, they were the really rounded numbers, too. Yeah. Uh, would that have been Didn't, Alex did, Suglobov? Did Bearsen wear it for one year? He was 94. Right? <coughs> oh, okay. Yeah, he was 94. Oh. I feel no, like Suglobov it's a, was in the 80s. He was like an 80 number. Mm-hmm. Is it, was it, was it, was it um, who was the defenseman? Carl something, or there was a... Pierre Hedin. <laughs> not Hedin. Uh, he Dr- was a Czech guy. Harold Drukin. Oh, no. Oh, he was a Czech player. And he probably, this guy probably would have played like 10 games. Um, not Francis Caberlet. No. no. 
Did he play for the Leafs? Carl Pilash. Maybe Carl Pilash. Was it no, Carl Pilash? I don't think it was Carl okay. Pilash. James, so we, we need an guys. answer here. <laughs> I don't know, guys. I was not a Leafs diehard, and no, this is like a '90s. This player. is Dot Blind Early. Spot, James era. <laughs> this is Phil Housley. Oh, oh shit! '96. Wow. Damn it! Oh, so, so. I remember right. being so excited for that trade too. Right. Freaking Phil Housley. Why, why would he trades? wear that number? I don't know. I don't know. Ron Weird. Francis. Is that how old he was? And Here's Gilmore, an easy one. I think, came back that year too and played a shift, mm-hmm. and then got his knee in. Ah, that's '84. The only player to wear '84 for Leafs. Grabowski. Yeah. Very good. Only player to ever wear 91. Uh, Tavares. John Tavares. Yeah. yeah, all right. Well done. Only player to ever wear 88 until this season. Eric Lindros. Lindros. Eric Lindros. Only player to ever wear 81. Kessel. Phil Kessel. Oh. No. <laughs> you're, 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 you're giving us some easy ones. Yeah, yeah, these are the easy ones. Only player to ever wear 77. Pavel Kabina. Ooh. Only player to ever wear 73. Is that Pierre Hedin? It might be. That might be a Hedin number. <laughs> uh, I don't know, <laughs> man. He wore it in uh, 2007. Oh, they sucked. Is Dude, the... wait, which one? 2006, 7 or 7, uh, 8? I don't know. Great. They didn't specify. Good. <laughs> um, I'm going to say Hedin. I'm sticking with Hedin. Right. I'm going to say that was also Pavel Kabina. Because remember, he, he had a few a different numbers? Yeah, he did. Oh, seven. Boy, God, that was. They, they were so dark bad. Years. No, dark, I'm, I'm dark not gonna, years. I'm not going to embarrass myself. Mm. It was Pavel Kabina. Hey! <laughs> That's your question. No way! He's the only player to wear 77 <laughs> and 73. Well done. Wow! Dude, well done. No well way! Done. Some, right. Somewhere you have a Kabina 73 jersey. Somebody out there has Jeff to have has it. Jeff has it, for sure. <laughs> Jeff, 100%. Jeff, Jeff, and it's spelled wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is a question from B. Willicks. What are your thoughts on having a junior team in the CHL playing out of one of the territories? Like Northern? Yeah. Travel well, would destroy you, them. Yeah. <laughs> Travel's already bad enough in some of those places. Like Prince George has a hell of a time. Hmm. One of the main issues in Canada that Americans don't face uh, is that we have a um, protectionist view when it comes to the airlines. And you can debate whether this is good or bad, but what happens is that only to, to fly from a Canadian city to a Canadian city, it has to be a Canadian airline. So if you notice, Does, you can't huh? take United from Toronto to Montreal. United's like super cheap and Delta's super cheap. You can't do that. And that's why airline prices are so expensive here. So it limits a lot of those teams. It's why a lot of them are on the bus. Or like it, it, I mean, it affects the AHL schedule. It's why they play three games in a row on a weekend sometimes because it's so expensive to move. Well, it's uh, been really hard on St. John's in Newfoundland. Oh, to, to have it, Like they keep losing teams, right? Like, well, so like they had a Adirondack. junior team. They had an AHL team. Yeah. Or a- not Adirondack. Abbotsford. A- Abbotsford, yeah. Abbotsford, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's that's that's something that so you the know, territories and it's also you get into the population problem too, where there's just not a lot of people up there. Yeah, so. right. Yeah, like I think they'd go. Uh, well, there was a kid drafted out of the Yukon this year, right? Yeah, JD Bunkus. <laughs> no, no, there was there was a, there was a player picked. Yeah. Oh wow. I could see like White Horse or something like that having it for sure. I just don't. Again, how, it's how the would travel. You get there? Yeah. It's the travel. All right, the Brandon Wheat Kings got to go travel to play Whitehorse. Yeah, figure that one yeah. out. I think uh, if you could find a way to lower airline prices, I think you can make it happen. Yeah, I think that's major. trains they got in Japan. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Just, Just have from, a go. From, uh, from Brandon to, to yeah. there. The only <laughs> thing that rides on it is the hockey team. That's right. That's yeah. Honestly, that would be enough, I think. <laughs> uh, other questions? Uh, we can close on this. Who played on the Leafs last year? Who had Pavel also Kubina. <laughs> previously played with Sergey Fedorov and Doug Gilmore? It's from Blackhawk Roses on Reddit. Played on the Leafs last year, yeah. and he played with Fedorov and Doug Gilmore. So, like, Fedorov, did Fedorov play in the KHL? Yes. So it could be a Russian. He played for Red Army, I'm pretty sure. Could be a Russian player. Yeah, but the only Russians on the Leafs last year were Ozhiganov and Zaitsev, yeah. who probably didn't play with Doug Gilmore. No. So Doug Gilmore's been gone for a long time, so it has to be an older player. So, well, you got Hainsey Marlowe. Um, I don't think it'd be Hainsey, though. I don't think so either, because he was Carolina and Pittsburgh. Hainsey well, played for Columbus, and Fedorov was on Columbus. So how would yeah, he that's have prob- played? Well, he played Montreal, too, right? So that's probably the right answer. Hainsey played in Montreal? Montreal yeah. Gilmore. 
Yeah. Well done. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> Hainsey right. played with Dougie. Had Dougie to be someone really Montreal. old. Yeah. <laughs> they were, still, they were yeah. still playing in the 90s. In right? his rookie season, he played with Dougie in Montreal. And then when he was on the Blue Jackets, Federoff was on there. So there, yeah, you there you go. Wow. Fun All fact. right, there you go. Well, listen, James, <laughs> it was so nice to have you back on. Thank you so much for making time for us. And yeah, hopefully it's not four years next it time. It will right? not be four years. <laughs> yeah. It might, it might it be five. a few months before we're harassing you again. Uh, but uh, it, honestly, congratulations on all the success with The Athletic. Uh, we're good friends with and uh, with all the writers. And, and honestly, they're, uh, the content you guys are creating is amazing. So thank you for doing that. And thank you for... Dropping some of that paywalled information on this show, we do appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for the plug. <laughs> no problem. And by the way, speaking of plugs, we got a couple that we should we should put in. First off, Easter Seals, right? Yes. Uh, Rachel's Raiders are back. Homie, uh, celebrityhockeyclassics.com. Uh, raising money once again. Easter Seals is a charity that uh, raises money for kids with physical disabilities. We played in that tournament last year, and we're going to do it again this year. Already up to fifteen hundred bucks. Um, the deadline's November fourteenth, oh. so we got some time. But I have a goal, a personal goal, of fifty thousand dollars, and that's not even what I expect out of our team, Adam. I want us to get even more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, so CelebrityHockeyClassics.com. Uh, I've tweeted about it a thousand times. You can go through my Twitter and, and find that. And if you go to RussianMachineNeverBreaks.com, uh, uh, I'm going to be going to Washington, D.C. That's going to be August 24th. Uh, going to be doing a book signing in the afternoon at One More Page Books. And uh, uh, Walters, I think it's called, from 6 to 9 at night. Uh in Washington. Once again, that's August 24th. Tickets, RussianMachineNeverBreaks.com. Is that some guy's house? Some some guy named Walter? <laughs> I assume so. Yeah, it's like uh, the, the one Rippers that they have in Halifax is called Ralph's. No, it's closed now. Oh, we, yeah, they closed Ralph's! Yeah, we found this out. That was very sad. R.I.P. Ralph. Sad. Um, I will be joining uh, the live Leafs Geek Geeks podcast this Thursday with along with J.D. Bunkus and uh, Mike Stevens. That's Mikey Stevens 81 because there's 80 million Mike Stevens. I might be going to that too. Are you coming? Might be. I haven't confirmed. Uh, it will be. Uh, it's it's going to be in support of Jumpstart, which is a Canadian tire charity. Gets kids into it. 250 Front Street, Boston Pizza. Doors at seven. All the details. I'll tweet them out. But obviously, you can you can follow at Ian Graff or Ian Tullock, uh, writer for the Athletic about this. But really excited about it. Should be kind of fun. A good group of people, and I mean, beers and pizza. I mean, I, I don't know how it, it gets any better than that for a good cause. So, you know, James has got his people out there doing good charitable work, which I like. And, uh, uh James, you got anything going on? <laughs> you, you working for anybody, gents? You, you want to you promote anything? Or I don't know. No? Subscribe today. <laughs> yeah! Is there a promo to code? What? Yeah, theathletic.com slash leaf report. 40% off for all new subscribers. Hey! Oh, there you go. Oh. There you go. All Good right. for you, man. I think you have a real future. <laughs> <laughs> That's the like. Hopefully we can keep it going. Yeah, right? Right? <laughs> Keep the lights on. <laughs> Maybe we'll get in the office one day. One day? Yeah. Yeah. Follow the guys on Twitter at Steve underscore Dangle. At Adam W Y L D E and at Jesse Blake. The Steve Dangle Podcast. Brought to you by Panago Pizza. Order at panago.com and stuff your face with deliciousness.